Where are you doing the things that you should rather than the things you know you are? We all learned in an early age that not being ourselves pays some dividends. Like we can manipulate the world a little bit by screaming until we got a lollipop or blaming our sister for the thing that we did. We could actually not tell the truth and get some positive output. We know the crack in the cement continued to grow and we never really went back to fix it. Now we can. You see, if you don't do that, you too are living a life of quiet desperation. You too are living a life of a song still unsung. Hello, my name is Dr. Fred Moss, and I'm here to talk a little bit about the article I wrote last year for the Conference for Global Transformation, or the Journal for the Conference for Global Transformation. The theme of the conference in 2019 was listening for fulfillment, and the article I wrote was called Global Madness, What Must Happen to Unite? It turns out that I am the recipient of the editor's choice, meaning the number one article as voted by the editors, submitted to the journal in 2019. And it's a great honor. So I wanna tell you a little story about how this article got written. I was in a little tip with my partner. I went into the other room and began to write an article. And I was looking at what starts disagreements and you know the us and the them. And, where does these arbitrary lines get drawn between who I think I am and who I think those people who are not like me are? Some, sometimes my girlfriend or sometimes other kinds of people or people from different ways of life or something like that. And then I began to really see that maybe the disenfranchised, those who we think we disenfranchise, might have access to a life that is enviable. So I wrote a little bit about that. And then I began to write a little bit more about the whole theme about how we're wired for us and them and what would it take to actually bring us as a group of 7.7 billion human beings together so that we no longer were dealing with all the discriminating differences between each other. I'm going to save what I came up with with that for you when you read the article that I'm presenting here called Global Madness, What Must Happen to Unite. So I submitted the article and I was told a couple months before that it had been chosen as one of the three articles uh, uh, that were given consideration as being the most um, impactful. And I led a breakout session with the other two wonderful authors that also wrote articles in that area. And as the conference came to a close in the closing session, I learned that they were going to now give an award for the number one article. And I was sitting about four sections back and they, this was in the Lowe's hotel where they actually give away the Academy Awards each year. And from the front of the room, sort of this fantasy unfolded as they began to talk about how they do this each year. And last year's recipient took the microphone. And when she did, and after she gave some introductions, she said something like, and the winner this year is Dr. Fred Moss for Global Madness, What Must Happen to Unite? And I was just flabber flabbergasted. I mean, really just floored. I took this walk that seemed like it took weeks to get up to the stage and then looked out over my friends, my people, the people in this conference, which brings together more than a thousand people who are up to really making a difference in the world. I mean, fully committed to making a difference in the world in multiple different arenas and multiple different directions. And I was able to make my declaration very clear to those people. Now, some of them knew a bit of my declaration, but in this case, I was actually able to state out loud that who I am is someone who's committed to altering or transforming the conversation of mental illness as a functional entity on a global scale. 
And then I was able to give my promise that each and every person will know that their voice can be heard and that who they are and what they do matters. And as I looked out over the crowd, I was just so humbled. And, you know, an award like that maybe only happens once in a lifetime, but it was for me one of the highest points in my life. So I now present you that article and I hope that you enjoy it. Please read Global Madness, What Must Happen to Unite. Thank you. For anyone who watched this video, I want to be, you know, make everyone aware of who you are and, and what you stand for. Um, I've, got a, uh, I've got a little blurb here. Um, one of you have, apparently you have served in the mental health industry for almost four decades. This is Fred, Dr. Fred Moss, who we have here. Um, so almost four decades in, in, this, in the mental yeah, health this industry. Jan this January 5th, will, this January 5th will mark, a, you know, in two months, will mark officially um, four decades. There you go, fantastic. And you've consulted with patients, practitioners, medical faculties, nonprofit organizations, community groups, um, as a non-diagnosis psychiatrist, and we'll get into that. I think that's really interesting, a non-diagnosis psychiatrist. Um, you are very active in shifting the conversation on mental illness on a global scale. And um, Dr. Fred Moss's services include mental health coaching, speaking, telehealth training, and expert witness testimony. That's interesting. Um, you're also working on a global uh, a film project called Global Madness, which is a fantastic title, I've got to say. Um, you're a graduate of Northwestern University Medical School and a licensed psychiatrist. Um, anyway, there's a, there's a long list of things I could say about you. You've been in the game for a long time, to say the least. Um, but what I find is, is most fascinating about you, Fred, and, and what's really drawn me to you in this conversation is just, you're sort of like me, you're sort of a black sheep in the industry and, and you, you're sort of good at naming the pink elephant in the room. Um, and you're, you're naming it in, an, in a field where it's actually, it's a big risk to name the pink elephant in the field you're in, I take it. And, and you, you, you've really stuck your neck out on this one. Um, and I want to just let you just yeah, dive in a little bit and tell us about, you know, what's your main, what's the main theme of your message? And, and so where is it, where have you derived that from? What's the experience you've had? that's made that such an important message in, in, in your own life. Sure, thank you. Yeah, it's, um, so I'll give you a little bit of a shortened version, but, but she'll try to catch the salient points. You know, I, ever since I was a child, I've really noticed as I've looked back at this recently, ever since I was a child, I've been really just um, uh, entertained or en entranced with the whole notion of the value of communication, of people being together and communicating. Uh, I, I grew up in a household where I had two brothers, um, 10 and 14 years older than me, and then my parents. And I would watch these adults, you know, from my playpen sometimes even, where they would be having some sort of something, and then they would get with each other and speak to and listen, and then life would change. And right. there was just something like, wow, that is, that is a cool tool. Like, I want to learn how to do that. And um, as I went through... Uh, school, I started realizing that I too had really enjoyed listening and really enjoyed speaking and really got to see the value of it. It was like, oh, this is the essence of the world. Like I really got that communication connection is the essence of the world. That's what makes things happen in this world. So when I was in junior high, I thought, well, I'll, I'll go learn how to do it. And in high school, the big guys, they must learn how to communicate because I can't wait to go to high school where they finally teach me how to formally communicate. Suffice it to say that didn't happen in high school at all. And so I was like, okay, I'll go to college. That's where it is. I'll go to the University of Michigan where, you know, all sorts of great stuff happens. Yeah. And for sure, I'll communicate there. And it took about six days in the dorm to realize that that wasn't going to happen there either. So when I left college, I, I actually, this was four, four decades ago this January, um, I got a job, you know, working in childcare work. And all of a sudden my communication with these kids was making a difference and I was getting paid for it. And it was like, wow, this communication thing does really work. 
And so I really saw that I could make a difference working the afternoon shift with these kids in the state hospital. And I was like, I, I think I have, I think I should go be a doctor. You know, I should go be a doctor so I can ride to the top and start making decisions on how this goes. Cause the doctors didn't seem to really, you know, it seemed like there was a role there for me to make a difference. So with a lot of good fortune, I was able to be a doctor and then take a, you know, do a residency and go to psychiatry as sort of as directed. And right around that same time, biological psychiatry was coming into fruition. It's like, you know, it was coming into the vogue. So in 19, it, while I was in medical school, Prozac was introduced to the world. And over the Prozac. next 12 years, Prozac was the number one drug prescribed in the world, all specialties included, oh, for 12 straight years. And Whoa. so, you know, and that includes all specialties, like, and that includes the entire world. And um, so it was like the whole field of psychiatry turned on its ear. Instead of I was now going to learn how to communicate, I got the rug pulled out from under me one more time. And now I was going to learn how to be a biological psychiatrist, like to fix these so-called chemical imbalances. And I was going to only be referred patients after everybody who had tried to already talk to them. And I wasn't even going to be asked to be the communicator. I was just going to be asked <laughs> to be the distributor. The <laughs> exactly. The, the, the pusher, basically. It, it really, it really is. And, yeah, yeah. you know, at the time, it was like, well, that's my job. I make a lot of money. I have a lot of power. I'm at the top of this so-called totem pole. I guess that's just how it's become. And I didn't lose my, I, you know, I trained, tried to, did some training in psychoanalysis. I did my own therapy. I did always hung on to communication, but I was getting to be an odd duck being a psychiatrist who actually communicates. <laughs> Good figure. As the field went on over the next 30 years, for, you know, 30, I, I began my psychiatric, actually being a psychiatrist in, in a graduated medical 88, so something like 30 years ago, um, I really became less and less counted on for my communication. And I just saw patients as not getting as well as I thought they could if connected to. So about 2006, I started taking medicines away from people who no longer seemed like they no longer needed it. They were doing pretty well. Let's give it a try. Low risk patients. And I'd take away their medicines and that we were never taught how to do that. And it would be like, wow, extraordinary results would surface. Like patients would get not just better, but they would be like their diagnosis would disappear. So this was a, this was a startling, astonishing effect and not so shocking actually, but nevertheless startling and astonishing. So I started using this with other patients and I, I began to get this notion that maybe the condition itself was perpetuating the symptoms that it was marketed to treat or the condition and the treatment were doing that. So I started using a little bit, you, know, you see what I'm saying? And so with, mm -hmm. I started doing it with even a little bit higher risk patients, you know, patients who thought that they had chronic mental illness and the same thing would happen. After a short period of time of being uncomfortable when the medicines were re removed, they would get their lives back on a regular basis. These people okay. would get their lives back. So, so let me just ask there, because obviously, you know, we're going to have, if any psychiatrist is listening to this and anyone who's, who is responsible for, for distributing some of these side drugs, uh, obviously there's some contraindications with it because if you just take them off the psych drugs. Not simple. You're right. And there's, it's, a, it's not simple, right? So, not so simple. we're not, we're not talking, you just simply took them off. No, and no, no. We're not talking about it. No. So, so we're, Define that a little more. A little more sure. Granular, like. Well, you have, not only is it not simple, you have to have somebody who really is done being done. You know, they're, they're like they really get that this is as good as it's going to get or they've gotten worse over time and they're no longer interested in the same pathway that's gotten them to be who they are. Right. So this is, a, this is a group of people that are specially chosen. And the, the other thing about these, so... I think if you fast forward a little bit, it isn't that I'm saying that the drugs alone are causing the symptoms they're marketed to treat. I'm actually, that's why I've moved to non-diagnosing rather than simply non-medicating. 
Okay, that, yeah, explain that. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So non medicating was one thing. Maybe the medications aren't doing as good as they are supposed to, or maybe they're actually causing side effects or symptoms of their own. But if you really back off one more step, and so with the diagnoses, as soon as I say to someone or someone says to someone that you have a condition that leaves you different than normal or leaves you afflicted or leaves you out, uh, of right. then we create a future for that person who then buys that future mm -hmm. as a way of, in fact, relinquishing whatever responsibility yes. they have for the control of their life. Fantastic. Absolutely. Got it. Yeah. All right. And not only that, but it's also making them feel special in a sense that, you know, oh, now I've been labeled with the this. Positives. They're all with this, it's like, I'm special now. I have, I have a legitimate condition that makes me very special. Exactly. And, and you know what? It's you know. not like it's bad or wrong. It's like we all like to feel special. And in fact, there's some real value. Mm. If I'm going to be a jerk, mm. if I'm going to make terrible errors, if I'm going to hurt somebody, if I'm gonna say something I later regret, if I am going to do something that is actually self injurious and I can explain away any of those things by saying I have a condition, yeah. I'm in. I'm in. Yeah, you're totally validated. You, you've, you've completely formatted and validated the, the, you know, the victim response. And this is, you know, I, I know this it sort of sounds harsh. I know it's, it sounds so harsh to say to people, they're playing this, I'm special, I, I'm pathological card. You know, I, I've got the illness, I'm the victim card. Um, but it's not like as if they're doing it volitionally or, or consciously. Exactly. No, it's a very, it's an inbuilt sort of. It's attractive. I mean, if, if someone has that much stress and, so, and, and uh, uh, really under some, a lot of tension in the world, in life, you know, as soon as they're given, not only given the opportunity, but, but promoted the opportunity to relinquish that responsibility, it's like, I'll have at it, you know, like that, that everyone, people are going to line up for that around the block. It's interesting, you know, taking a, you and I know, and not, and I think that's, that might be where we're at with the transformation or the transitions of what's going on inside of, you know, our men's work, which is the opportunity to really take a look at the value of being accountable and responsible for one's life, even when what you do is flies against who you would want yourself to be. Like really getting that yeah. even when you're yeah. a jerk, that's really part of being a man. Part of being <laughs> a man. Yeah, it's not, yeah, it's not some unique condition. <laughs> it really isn't. It really, really isn't. And even when you're depressed or confused or aimless yeah. or anxious or nervous or hearing, even hearing the little chatter in your head or yeah wishing harm on somebody or yourself like welcome to humanity is the name of my oh. hashtag and that's what that you know yeah. that's where i run it's a welcome to humanity yeah. is is what we're talking about so got it brilliant we fast forward so that we're no longer blaming big pharma or blaming doctors we're actually saying that once i say once you come to me like what's wrong with me and i say yes indeed there's something wrong with you and you say oh Good. What is it? And I say, you have X. X. And you yeah. say, yay, I got X. That explains everything. Yeah, right. <laughs> Unreal. And I say, yeah. I'm glad I don't have X. Yeah. Because yeah. if I had X, I wouldn't be able to see that you do. Yeah. So as a diagnosis, or yeah. I have all sorts of, it's great for me to diagnose people. It leaves me untouchable. Yeah, yeah. And Make, it's great to be diagnosed. It's great. The whole thing is really great. It really is. It's really great. There's no one to blame. There's not the medicine people yeah. to blame or the doctors or the patients yeah. or the family. Like everybody gets value here. Yeah. Everyone gets validated on some level. Yeah. They, they really do. Yeah. Yeah. And not in a healthy way, but in a, in a, in, in, in like the dysfunctional aspect of us gets validated very, right. very succinctly. Yeah. You know, I think Sal, the thing that's really great, that, you know, in this 39th year and the 40th year is I've, I've, you know, it's taken a while to get to the place where I can be presentable about this and not just be furious. <laughs> the, don't, lose the, don't lose the fury, brother. <laughs> yeah, the, the idea is that, that people are, um, you, I can, it's possible to be, compassionate with everyone involved in the game yeah 
Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good. That's an interesting point. Including the, well, let's let's talk about that because that that's a whole other level. Like in, including the pharmaceutical companies. Exactly. All right. So tell me about that. So how would you All say? Right. So let's, how, how do you, yeah. let's look at the pharmaceutical company. Yeah. So, that's a good. That's a good way to go. That's like that's like as as Jordan Peterson would say, giving the devil its due. Let's say. You know, yeah. So yeah. let's look at let's look at that. So listen. The number one most profitable industry in the history of planet Earth is the pharmaceutical company presently yeah. in, yeah. in the Western yeah, it's, world. It's outpaced even the, 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 Gross the, the, military, the, the military complex. The, the right. military really yeah. Greater than the military complex. Even greater. It's number now, one. You can't really knock some, I mean, in some ways it's like, wow, that's very successful. Like, mm. And it isn't like... In other words, they didn't put it in the water. They prescribed, you can't blame the rat poison people for designing rat poison. It is a whole system that has it be that you or someone actually runs to the pharmacy, fills it, takes off the top twice a day and eats it. There's something to that that isn't entirely about the manufacturers of the drug itself. There needs to be a market as much as a producer, you know, that the, the producer doesn't exist in, in a vacuum, is what you're saying. Exactly. It's actually, yeah. I mean, I suppose it's an argument that we hear most recently inside mm -hmm. the gun and, you know, gun firearms industry, the same thing, where Smith & Wesson isn't who's on fire here. Yeah, yeah. Not only them. Yeah. The gun makers don't pull the trigger, after right. all. And yeah. the drug makers don't force in any way there's a whole cascade of system that yeah. happens before mom waits in line at the pharmacy two hours a week to get her medicine to come home and sort them and eat them <laughs> there's a lot invested in that <laughs> there's a there's lot, a lot. yeah and well, so it goes, it goes it speaks right to the shadow of the human nature you know in general exactly. you know? yeah yeah, and so you it's, can be it's deeper than this bad guy and this victim. It's it's a deeper underlying shadow aspect of human nature itself. It, it really is. And you can start getting, in case you don't, I mean, I I knew some drug representatives when I was doing more conventional work. In fact, I, I did some work with, with one of the big drug companies where I was a speaker for one of the medications. And I had some very friendly relationships with drug representatives and, and pharmacists inside of some of these drug companies that were just fine people. Really, yeah. fine yeah. people. Like, yeah. please move in next door, kind of people. Got it. Yeah, yeah. It's were they aware? Of, but were they aware of the sort of? Uh, but 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 it's one thing to be fine, but I guess it's also another thing to be just completely ignorant of the underlying condition that and, and the shadow that, that that these companies are playing into. Are they aware of it or, or are they just Here's completely the believe to it? All, that is not the perspective that they have about what they do. What they have is right. research and development that supports the betterment of humankind by the result of better living through chemistry. Right. Got it. And they are quite certain that that's yeah. the industry that they have thrown their life at for the betterment yeah. of humanity. And one cannot knock that who wouldn't want to be part of the betterment of humanity. Yeah. Yeah. So... You start looking at each and every piece and the absolute beauty of the lattice that has been created inside yeah. the organization, which sort of starts with the individual being so certain that they are abnormal, that they seek help to be confirmed that they are. And yeah. that's one place that the cascade really starts. Yeah, well, that's what, like, I, I want to come back to that because I think that's really what's very key and what's, the most powerful aspect of your message because we, we talk a lot about the big bad guy you know in pharmaceutical and the big bad guy and the the, the the military complex and the big big bad guy in the government we talk about the the big bad guys out there and, and the poor victims in here but but i think what's really important about your message is that it, it, it's a it's an intrinsic like a tapestry that you, you talk about like a whole tapestry here and um the only way for, for as an individual to, un to, to, to unweave that tapestry, to, to, to untangle yourself from that tapestry, let's say, is, is to understand the, 
the narrative that's at play to begin with, that you're buying into to begin with, i.e., oh, good, like you said, oh, good, now I've been diagnosed with X. Yeah. I feel something. I feel special. I feel like there's, there's some there's some way that I it, it's confirming something about me, which in which, like you said, it's like like I can relinquish a lot of my responsibility, and and I think that's a great relief. Fundamentally, is the relief of responsibility, and I think that's. Uh, and we're not talking just like you know, we're talking a deep existential responsibility here, exactly. not just not just a, a, a trite sort of um, responsible to take the rubbish exactly. out or yeah, yeah, to pay exactly. my bills. It's like no responsibility for, for my existence itself. Exactly. That's really where where the, the real the real thread comes undone when you start to 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 reclaim that 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 relationship with existence. So exactly. So, so tell me this. So lead me through it because I know it's come a long way from, since Prozac, right? So now we've got the SSRIs, and I want to go into a little bit more about the SSR, SSRIs and <laughs> the, the, the 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 monster that that's really eating American children and, and 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 people in general. I think it's one of the greatest. You know, we I think we've we've given the devil its due, as, as you've explained, but I think it's worth looking at, like why you know, how, how such instrumental evidence of the damage that these things can do has been so vastly overlooked by, by large organizations, government policy, you know, people at large, culture at large. You know, when I look at um, the shootings, for example, when I, when I see that there are these rampant shootings all around America that aren't happening in the rest of the world, they are ha only happening in America. Well, there, there's some happening out there, but not in the prolific way they're happening here. Um, and and the research that's been done, the, the fairly conclusive research that's been done on pretty much all of the perpetrators is that they were on some heavy heavy duty SSRIs or coming off of some some scheduled you know dosage, um, and they were just they, they were messed up. I mean, their depression had reached a point of like absolute murderous intent and tell me like why why is that such why is to me that's a just a pink elephant in the room that no one's talking about so so why is that <clears throat> so there's a number of questions here and i'd like you to consider the possibility of leaving them in question form rather than me giving you an answer to the question so there's there's a couple things what do you think what do you what do you propose if that's if or even if you don't agree with that i mean do you agree with that one and if, if so why do you think so, yeah and that's a pretty loaded there's question a, well there's a number of questions i'd like to there's a number of questions yeah. that you're proposing here that i think yeah. leave us in inquiry more than anything else so again number yeah. one um, I think we have to be very careful not to point the finger at the, look, again, if people were eating rat poison as a way of managing, uh, you know, warts, we wouldn't blame rat poison for the problem. And so it's really important to get that this is a complex. Hmm, that it's right. not the terrible SSRIs in the same way that it wouldn't be the terrible rat poison that's doing right. it. It's a complex of multiple different variants working together to create a system that everybody gladly goes forward in the wheel in. Everyone takes the next step in the wheel to make the whole thing a cycle that, that continues to persist. So the other thing is, is that the SSRIs are not any more or less evil than any of the other psychiatric medications. Um, the, the, it's very rare that someone is simply on an SSRI and that's all. These days, almost everybody is given multiple different combinations of medicines. And also with the street drugs that people use, whether that be alcohol or marijuana based drugs uh, or if uh, you know the any kind of crystal methamphetamines or if people you even the food that we eat is tainted frequently mm -hmm. it's like you know there's our, our our food our our food supply is frequently non-edible you know there's nothing edible about most of the food that people eat every day um, and the food and drug administration 
are, is called the Food and Drug Administration because it's the same administration. That's why food and drugs yeah. are like the same people who make decisions about McDonald's being food are the people who make decisions about Prozac being good for you. So the other right. piece, the other piece here is that these drugs have, they've gone through enough changes that, you know, Prozac is no longer Prozac. So after, after the 12 years or whatever the given, some companies have different patent uh, periods, the drug then goes to generic, which, and the generic is absolutely nothing, not even close to what the original medicine was, and yet we buy it as if it's the same. Right. Um, and so the, these things are made in third world countries, that they're made at the lowest level. You know, they have to win a, they have to win a, um, a quality issue. Yeah, it's quality. not, there, there's not seen, there, no, once, once they fall off a patent, there's nobody watching, the FDA is not responsible for it anymore. Wow. And so there's a, you know, there's a, there's a, um, a bidding war that takes place between the generic made in Pakistan and the generic made in Bangladesh and the generic made in Guadalajara. And, you know, whoever has the lowest one is the one that Target or Walmart or, you know, wow. Walgreens buys that month. And that's why the colors of your drugs change every month. And that's why you pay four dollars for your drugs because the the and that's why there's a pharmacy on every corner because the profit margin is three dollars and ninety nine cents plus for every four dollars that you pay. Yeah, that's and why. That's no one's a, watching this geez. stuff. Yeah. No one's watching this stuff. In the same yeah. look, bread, Wonder Bread, and German chocolate cake both have wheat as their main active ingredient <laughs> right the main substrate to suggest for a second that we're going to replace german chocolate cake with the same amount of wheat in wonder bread and call it the same hmm. is insane right but the public buys that too yeah yeah and they're not interested in what's really inside it, says, it. it just... says on the bottle generic equivalent to or substitute for and we just go cool we get getting a great deal thank god we have insurance four dollars gets us a drug that used to cost us four hundred dollars when in fact nothing's the same it's such a cluster it's such a cluster in the end yeah but here's the thing i really want to get forth to our viewers sal and to you maybe and to me <laughs> which is really that the responsibility for what i put in my mouth is mine Period. Yeah. yeah, well, that's true. Period. Period. Yeah, yeah. Period. Got it. That's the real big takeaway. I mean, really, it's the big takeaway. And, and, and not only that, but, but like, but I think also it comes back, it's, it's a full circle back to what you said originally. It was like, what is the story we're making up about ourselves that makes us so willing to give away responsibility to these things. Thank you. Let's yeah. take a break for one second. I got to get a cord. If you want to hit pause, I'll be right back. Yeah. All right. There you go. Good, good time. Yeah. All right. We are back with Mr. Fred Moss. Yeah. I think that we were looking at a couple things. And I think if we're really going to make any, if we're going to make any headway here, we're going to have to spend time not villainizing, not too much time villainizing the evilness of certain components of the cycle. I think what we have here, Sal, which is what yeah. I'm so attracted to what you're up to, and I think vice versa, is we have an opportunity to look from now forward on how we can make a difference in the narrative to bring forth to men yeah. in our case, but all people, what's available to like what is it why would i want to be responsible for a life where i'm screwing up every day yes yeah what's the draw look if i have the right if i have the opportunity to be responsible for my life and i do i screw i don't know about you i screw up like many times per day and sometimes terribly if i could and i don't like it i don't like that experience i don't like being responsible for being an asshole i don't like that mm. and 
if I could give that up to you, where I could blame you for me being an asshole, I would do that in a second. <laughs> and I, the human I, condition, one on one. <laughs> <laughs> I get to do that inside of the world of the medical, of the yeah. mental health institution, mental health and mental illness. I get to do that. Now, it here, here's a funny fact. Not ha ha funny, but funny. And that is, there is no medical specialty. If mental health is considered a medical specialty, which of course it is, although I contend that it might not be such, but if it is, there is no mental, there's no medical subspecialty for which when you see a doctor and you're told you're okay, you get upset, except in mental health. If people come, oh, right. Interesting. That's people, an interesting point. Yeah, got it. People come to see me and I say, you don't have a problem? Boom. They are not pissed. happy about that. They They're are pissed. pissed. Damn, isn't that the crap? Isn't that the crap? But if you're coming in for a doc to a doctor for a medical, some biological Yeah, do I pain, have prostate pain, cancer? No, pain. I don't. Oh, good. Oh, fantastic. I'm great. Do I have um do I have high blood pressure? Oh, good. Do I yeah. But do yeah, I right. have mental illness? No. I'm going to go find me a real doctor who tells me <laughs> that I do. He can really confirm how fucked up I am. Yeah. Why did I come to see you if it was to hear that I didn't have a psychiatric? Yeah, right, right, right. Dude, well, that's a really interesting point. Hey, this is really interesting stuff. This yeah. is really getting to the, right to the bedrock of, 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 of what's driving this industry and what's driving what, the shadow within this whole industry, that, you know, and within the people that, that are all embroiled in it. Yeah. Well, um, we spend we spend a lot of times pointing fingers at the 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 component that's right adjacent to us. So we might yes. so pharmacy would be big pharma doesn't give a hoop that people think it's a, a, a you know an, a villain industry. What do they yeah. care? They don't care. It's not even that big a deal. For, who cares? And yeah. we point we like or some people point and eh, doctors or oh you know like insurance yeah. companies or oh, it's the, it's the DSM or it's whatever, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's really possible to get. Yeah. I think for me, um, some of the greatest turning points in the work I've been doing with men for many years now is um, coming from that Jungian perspective where, you know, you're really embracing the unconscious. You really, you really, you're not, you're not sort of embroiled like like a lot of the work, a lot of personal development that I see out there today is very much, um, which has been called the cult of consciousness, which is about just it's just like you know motivational talk and, and really self talk and, and just really using propping oneself up on ideas of themselves and very contrived social norm, socially contrived sort of ideas of what it means to be the an upright citizen, you know. Yeah. And a vast, and, and a really, what I see is a, a, an epi epidemic, cultural denial of the, the, the power of the unconscious. The, yeah. The, what's what's held within, below the surface of our, <laughs> of our, of our, of our mind in, in a way that's like, we're, we're terrified of. We need to, we, we, we spend so much time trying to categorize and contain every aspect of our weight, of our thoughts and our feelings and our emotions that, we don't understand that there's, there's aspects of us which have been in, in development over hundreds, you know, millions of years that are actually autonomous. It, you know, they're not, we don't have a conscious, we, we're not part of that. So I think, you know, when people come to you and they say, hey, you know, like, I'm really fucked up. And you say, hey, you know, welcome to humanity. You know, this is, you ju you're just feeling aspects of your unconscious bubbling to the surface that you just don't have a way of categorizing or knowing. So, so let's just, so instead of looking at it as a, as a pathology, let's just embrace it as a part of, in fact, let's even celebrate the fact that something has risen to the surface that we can actually accommodate and, yeah. and embrace and, and, and use as, a, as, as, as medicine or as a tool for insight. Yes. As opposed yeah. to, okay, this is bad. We need to pathologize this. We need to, we need to bash this deeper into this unconscious and medicate the fuck out of it. I mean, this is like, to me, one of the greatest issues, this, this is more of a deeper issue, is, is, the, is the terror 
of the mystery, the terror that we have of the unconscious mind and how we just medicate ourselves out of it in whatever way possible, whether it's medication or whatever addiction we use to suppress. Yeah. To, to suppress these well, things. I love what you're saying. And at the end, I want to add one thing, which is it would be great if we could medicate ourselves out of it. But by medicating, it doesn't work to do that, unfortunately. And if it could, if it really could, I would probably be a proponent of it. But it doesn't. You know, we don't really take medicine and relieve ourselves of our shadows. In fact, as you notice by what you were saying about the epidemic of the shootings is that almost all, if not all of the shootings are done by people who have been on or are on uh, high powered psychiatric medications or have diagnoses, yeah. et cetera, SSRIs yeah. and many other types. And yeah. the, the, the thing that's really, um, well, you know, the thing that, that, that uh, okay, I'm, I'll, I'll just stop there for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, you know, it's just like the, I think I'm going to ask you. Uh oh, you got, you got, you got hesitant. You're frozen. There you go. Try me again. Try me again. Yeah, I'm just, I'm letting it catch up. I'll, I'll edit this bit out. Okay. You're good. You're good. So if you want to say something, start again from here. Otherwise, we'd move on. Go ahead. Was there anything else you wanted to say about the SSRIs in general or? or well, I just think that it's, a, you know, it's just like um, these medicines don't do, they're not successful in medicating ourselves out of our shadow. In fact, what happens is our shadow gets even more exposed typically when on medication because access to the eternal and access to spirituality, access to the collective consciousness is interrupted when we interrupt our thinking and our thought processes with these medications so that yeah. access to our higher power or the collective consciousness or other people is interrupted and in fact, there may be a sense of a numbness temporarily, but really what's left is uh, someone who is much less likely to be, um, you know, to be uh, comfortable than, than, you know, if you, for instance, I yeah. like to use this particular analogy for this, for this discussion, which is, if I come to a doctor with a mosquito bite on my, on my elbow and it's been there for a couple of weeks and it's just irritating. I mean, I can't sleep at night and you know, I, I, I can't, I can't get any comfort. And the doctor says, you know, you're very lucky. I'm a, I'm a mos mosquitologist. I'm a mosquitologist. And I, I have a, um, I have a treatment that works for this because you got a special kind of mosquito bite. It's like, okay, great doctor. I knew you would be the great doctor for this. And you say, okay, well, here's the deal. We're going to amputate your arm from the shoulder down. And we guarantee 100% success rate. <laughs> you won't have that itch anymore. You will not have a mosquito bite on your elbow. <laughs> That's a good one. And so you're like, well, cool. Is anything to get rid of my mosquito bite because you're so myopic yeah. that yeah. really you think your only problem is your mosquito bite. Yeah. So the doctor says, it's only going to hurt for a minute. We'll do a little bit of anesthesia. Everything will be good. And he pulls out the band saw or the jigsaw or whatever kind of saw yeah. and slices off your arm. Yeah. And you come back in two weeks and they take the microscope off to see if you still have an elbow with a mosquito bite on it. And it turns out yeah. that you don't. You got your cure. So are you, are you saying that this is what SSRIs are? Is, is uh, not just SSRI. I wouldn't, I wouldn't blame it. Well, let's, let's say all, all like of the medicine. I am saying, saying that the, like the, the price of taking these medications is not only yeah. do you lose access to the mood that you otherwise would have had, but you lose a whole chunk Got of it. your life. Got it. Yeah. Well, there you go. It's a great analogy. Thank you. It's a good one. Yeah. I mean, this is, look, I think, and as you said before, it is a complex because like, as you know, if you combine, if you layer, if you have a, if a teenage who's, who's one going through hormonal insanity, 
two has probably got really poor, poor you know, statistically speaking, it probably has a poor or, or, or zero relationship to his father. Three um, is, you know, it, under, under the pressure of a, of a deeply, you know, uh, you know, identity, you know, the meaningless of education, that the, the meaningless that's, that's been, in, that the meaningless that's been imbued in, in the education system. Um, there's a lot of things going on there. And then you, you layer on top of that, <laughs> psych drugs, powerful psych drugs. You've got a, you've got a, a recipe for, for, for some, oh, and, or, also, you layer on top of that access to guns. You've got a recipe, major fucking disaster. I mean, so, but I do think that 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 uh, the the rational that that, that that slight piece of the mind that that the rational part of the mind that says, okay, it's it's not going to be a good idea to open up on a on a on a, on a, on a classroom full of kids with my AK forty seven. Yeah. It's not such a good idea. That 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 critical factor of the mind is like, you got to you got to marvel at what it would take to switch that off i mean that would yeah. be, that's a pretty that's a pretty amazing feat to have that part of the mind turned off yeah it's a, you got it to marvel at that you know? it is something and even see this is where we start getting back to one of the questions you asked early on which is that um Uh, okay, that coming off the medicines mm -hmm. doesn't immediately open those channels. So the channels that are blocked when being off medicines don't immediately just become available upon stopping medicines. Right. So the process of stopping medicines is complicated. Got it. Mm -hmm. And The medicines are the way our physiology works or the combination of how our physiology works with medications that are blunting us is that upon the true departure of a medicine, you get a spike of the symptoms that the drug is marketed to treat. Yeah. So whether or not you were depressed when you started antidepressants, when you come off of the antidepressants, you will be depressed. And probably it will it'll appear to be quite severe, I imagine. It will appear to be severe, and you will think that it's a, this is you returning. Yeah. But it's not you returning. It's actually simply a product of what happens when you come off the medicine, but you equate it to the reason you got on it in the first place. Yeah, interesting. And then you are left with, well, I didn't like taking medicine, but when I came off, my depression came back in spades, and therefore, given the choice of having the depression that led me to take the medicines in the first place or the blunted lifestyle, the armless lifestyle I have yeah. when I'm on medicine, I'm going to thank back. God for the medicine. I'm going to stay on these forever. Yeah. And then you become an accomplice yeah. for why these medicines can't be stopped. Yeah. God, it's a vicious cycle, hey? Vicious. Tell me this. I'm sure like taking a, a kid off or anyone for that matter off medicine without, l let me ask you, what do you think would be other critical factors that would that need to be included when taking someone off medicine? I mean, you said diet, I'm imagining diet, environment, social influences, like I, mean, I guess there's a bit of a laundry list of, of, of crucial factors that need to be in place before someone just, just goes off meds and hoping that that's going to work. What do you think would be uh, uh, some of the more crucial factors in that transition? You coming off of medicine is your question? Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a readiness, there's a willingness, there's a being tired enough. There's this, you know, the idea of being sick and tired of being sick and tired comes to play here. The idea right. that, that, the, the willingness to consider other possibilities. You know, there are some situations, an unfortunate amount of situations for which um, 
Well, I wouldn't say it's necessarily unfortunate, it's just what's so. To which continuing miserably works for the system that you're surrounded by and you. So you as a patient, like in continuing for you to be miserable is perfect. Right. And everyone needs you to be miserable and you need to be miserable. Explain. <laughs> there is a lot Explain. of mileage that comes from always being miserable. Oh, there you is. mean so when you when you come off the so when you come oh, off the drug. Like, these are the people who don't who aren't ready to come off medicine. Oh, okay. So it's there's an identity be... that's built into being ongoingly diagnosed and miserable and getting worse. Right. So that misery becomes uh, okay. familiar and familiarity trumps the possibility. Oh, I see. Yeah, got it. Yeah. It, it plays into the narrative very nicely and, and it makes things very manageable <laughs> just because of the familiarity of it. Or unmanageable, at familiar. It can be unmanageable and familiar, but I'll tell you what, it has, there are some people who, for which coming off a of medicine wouldn't, isn't even a possibility at all. Not at all. Not interested, neither is the rest of the system. Even if they're miserable and getting worse, they have no interest in coming off medicine. Right. So it's not even an option. It just, work, not, it just works. It just works for them to be getting worse. It just works. Right. Yeah. And so you can't keep <laughs> everyone. That's part of the process. Is yeah. You can't well, I guess. Yeah, so I guess fundamentally what you're saying is, is like, you know, there's all these different factors that need to be, that, that would help if they're in place when someone wants to get off. But one of the fundamental factors is a willingness to go, I guess is a willingness to say, I'm sick of being a victim. I'm sick of having no control over my life. I'm sick of not being in the, in the driver's seat. I think fundamentally that must be that uh, uh, one of the deepest choices that, that the person has to make. It's like, yeah, like I'm not in control of my life at all, and I'm fucking over that. I'm sick of that. Like, well, what is that? What what are, what other option is there than that? Yeah. Well, so here's the thing about what you're saying. Over time, even I know I have an experience of this, and I think you probably do too. Which is, you know, sometimes when I'm not feeling on top of my game. And I start to consider, would I even hire, if I had a choice, would I hire me to be in charge of my life? <laughs> right. And the answer is no. You know, sometimes, answer, <laughs> no, I look, well, that's I, honest. I, I, know, I know that's, I don't, I am not qualified. <laughs> that's honest. And so yeah. I think in, yep. in many cases with people who have diagnoses and mental illness, the notion that I want to take control of my life has long been left in the rear view mirror. I thank goodness I don't have control of my life because I couldn't do it even if I did. Wow. That's 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 a brutal statement, but but I, I get the truth and I, I get that that's where a lot of people are coming from right. at that stage. Yeah. Right. I mean far up. I mean it just makes you just it just makes you solve the the human will. You know the human, the, the, the sovereign will of a human being. It's yeah. like it's it's a precious. It's not a it's not a small thing. It's a very precious. It's a precious asset we have. The ability to 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 have the will to choose between a life of misery and a life of, of, of thriving and magic. I mean that's. It's not just new age speak. No. <laughs> it's a fundamental aspect of of what makes us exist. <laughs> You know, it's interesting as you say it, and it isn't like I had this answer waiting, but as you say it, one of the, it is, you had it as a sort of binary, misery versus a life of thriving magic. And what I think I hear you say, maybe based on our previous discussion is, in order to live a life of thriving magic, one needs to incorporate the misery that's inherent in being alive. That- Yeah, yeah. It's not like, it's not like in this, in spite of, it's inclusive. Exactly. You know, because as, as the supersy, you know, the, the, the wound, or in, that, in this case, the misery, the wound is the gateway to the soul. And what they mean by that is, is and, the, you know, and you, I know you, you understand what I'm saying when I, when I describe this, is when you work with a human being, you're, 
you can see the you can see the, the cycle of misery that they're, the loop of misery that they're, they're so yeah. addicted to and if that was to collapse then they would drop into such a deep well of, of existed the, the, the deepest well of their existence is is going to become available to them and that's really scary for a lot of people or to anyone really the vastness of, of who they are outside of their their idea of self and so you're opening up a real can of worms there and but you're also opening up the, the the massive potential of who that person can be. So it's, so it's, you can't experience your fullest potential without, you know, dropping into the deepest can of worms. That's your life as a human being. And, uh, and on all, on all the inherent pain that goes along with, with being a human being. Yeah. You know, as, as, as the old, as the old saying goes, pain is inherent. Suffering is optional. You know? Yeah. The pain of living, breathing and, and having a body is inherent, but, but, you know, the way you, the narrative you make up around these things is, is actually, is, is optional. But you, you, yeah, it's like you said, like we, we can't access the, the, our greater nature without letting it all in, you know, embracing every piece of, every horrible, stinky aspect of ourselves, especially as men, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we are stinky, we are stinky yeah. dysfunctional creatures. <laughs> You're right. You're right. We have a. We. It seems like we have a, a a greater access to that kind of pain, at least the ones that I think you and I are talking about. And you know, that's why one of the things that I'm. I, mean, I think I'm going to go full circle here. I think you have really yep. led a great inquiry. But one of the things that that you remind me of is what we really all want more than anything. I'm quite certain of this. Going back to me in the playpen, watching my brothers and my and my parents, is we want to feel heard and connected. We want to, We want what we say to land over there. Like we, like it's real important that even in our discussion that you get the idea that I'm hearing what you're saying and that you're hearing what I'm saying without, that's what we want more than anything inside of human nature is to have made a difference or to be heard. Now, what Welcome to Humanity has paid attention to as a brand is yeah. that the listening can come from non-vocalized self-expression as well. So the creative aspects of us, like music, art, singing, dancing, drama, cooking, writing, gardening, photography, cleaning, all of those cleaning. things, cleaning. So cleaning is number 10 of the list of 10. And it's number 10 because what we're really talking about here is applying the creative force yeah to yeah. the world around us and cleaning even on the most uh, even on the mundane level even on a, a, a level. magical experience yeah yeah it's, a, it's an act of creativity and yeah. in that act we then we then validate ourselves at a very very high level when we're being yeah. self-expressed and so when you say people sometimes say well dr fred like what do you mean you're going to take away all these diagnoses and treatment? Like, what are you going to replace it with? And it's like, well, it's <laughs> good question. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Let's start with your environment. <laughs> Let's start cleaning up your shit. <laughs> Let's start with creating something just small, a reflection of, of yourself. I mean, it's true what you say. I mean, you know, cleaning up, you often hear, uh, you know, military sergeants saying, you know, make your bed in the morning as, as the first act you do. And, yeah, it's, right. and, it's, and it's not just some trite idea. It's a really, it's what you're doing is cleaning up. You're, 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 you're externally referencing an internal state of being. Yes, exactly. And, and, and it, it's, 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 it's internal. You're cleaning up your bedroom. You're, you're making your bed, but you're making your bed bed <laughs> it's inside that you're making your bed and that exactly. it's a very safe you know this, this most mundane act can can become a sacred act exactly um i think these are really important keys for anyone looking to climb their way out of a hole of depression or or or, or self-annihilation you know, so really yeah. to see the sacred in, in the most mundane things yes you know fred i want to um I want to, we're going to wrap this up. I want to just, um, you just tell us a little bit more about your MIDI project, about what you're doing, about how people can reach you, about like what's on offer. I mean, because this is a really, you know, 
I don't know if, I mean, this is, I don't know if anyone else gets the importance of this conversation, but it's, it's, to me, it's profound. And to me, it's one of the key turnstones that's going to make a difference in, especially in America, which is just so addicted to this, that the opioid crisis here is just insane. And, and I think it's, it's one of the major conversations going to start emerging this, this decade. And if, like it's, it's a pink elephant. that's like, it's so fat, but it's impossible not to see it now. So, so I, I really applaud you for Thank you. having such an articulate and not in an articulate way, but having, you know, having boots on the ground with this, with this thing and actually being out there affecting change in whatever way you can, you know, in real life, not just talking about it. So I really applaud you for that. Sure. So, so how can people reach you and learn more about what you do and, and, and the movie right. you're, you're involved with? Tell us about that. Right. So, we're, you know, I'm up to lots of things. And, and basically, it, it looks like five prongs. And the five prongs sort of uh, come like five prongs as part of a hand. And um, the uh, five prongs are all related to each other and they're all, they're all part of the hand. So the best way to get a hold of me is you can DM me on Facebook at the Dr. Fred Moss where you can find me or through Welcome to Humanity, which is my group, or through Global Madness, which is, I'm sorry, my Global Madness is my page and Welcome to Humanity is my group on Facebook. But you can also write me to Dr. Fred at welcometohumanity.net. Dr. Fred at welcometohumanity.net. Um, and you can find me, um, you know, there's a, there's a couple different spaces. I have a LinkedIn uh, campaign going. Sure. I have some YouTube. And, and, but sure, I, sure. Right. And so here's tell, us the about, tell, us about, tell us about the movie. Tell us about now, the movie. Tell you about the movie. The movie's called Global yeah. Madness. It's, it's, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, brainstorm sort of uh, he, what the story is is that last year I was uh, involved in putting something together called intercontinental psychiatry and what I had there was that I wanted an office in all seven continents and I wanted to people to be able to come to the office virtually or real with the mental illness and leave without one and I thought that the process could be two or three months so I told a bunch of people that last year and they're all like you're nuts, you're crazy, <laughs> that's not gonna work. Why would you do that? You know, and I was like, all right, maybe I don't know what's going on here because I feel very comfortable that I could do that, but they didn't feel so comfortable. So I got this idea that maybe I don't know what's going on globally to the mental health world. And maybe I'm not expert enough or I don't have the, right. so what would happen if I went like Anthony Bourdain did or I went like, like Dan Jones or if I went like Sergey, you know, Gupta, Sanjay Gupta, and I went off to the world and really saw how mental health and mental illness is dealt with in various culturally diverse areas of the planet. And what happens to people who are outcasts in various cultures? Because I know for sure that they get handled differently in various areas. We've picked out a number of areas already, Norway and Finland and Australia and Tanzania and Rwanda and, you know, um, others. Um, Wow. And we we're this going cool. to go there and interview the people who are involved, the caregivers, the patients, the families, mm -hmm. the shaman, the medicine men, right. the yeah. you know, people who are of, in, of nature and really get a notion. See, here's the ultimate outcome. The ultimate outcome is that we will see that there is no such thing inherently as mental illness, that it is right. a function of the culture that you're in only. And like when you got a broken bone, there's such thing as a broken bone. You take that broken bone to Rwanda, you still have a broken bone. You take that broken bone to Auckland, uh, New Zealand, yeah. it's still broken, I still promise. a broken bone. <laughs> yeah. But that's not true with this notion of mental illness at all. It right. changes. And yeah, changes. mental illness is going to have a, if you're in a, in a, with a shaman in the middle of Ecuador, you know, he's not going to, he's going to see mental illness in a very different way than, than your psych. Or, or maybe not even see it, which is what the real question is, is that mental illness is just a conversation. And because it's just yeah. a conversation, it's subject to immediate and total profound transformation. Yeah. That's what we're here to do. And we're going to do that in an entertaining way. A documentary team and 
I, maybe yeah. I can be, you know, with a little bit of training, I probably can be an interviewer with the level of at least charisma to be entertaining, like to be compelling. <laughs> and, and well, you get to speak. You get to communicate. That's the thing I, you were born to do. So. To do. <laughs> exactly. We get to lean back on what I think is really the <laughs> where, you're, where it all started. Exactly. Where it all started in communication. So thanks, Fred. This has been a really great talk. And, um, uh, and I really implore people to, to, to really, men especially, I mean, women and men, but, but I think, uh, I mean, it's every, statistically speaking, men are the ones doing themselves in a lot more these days. And I yeah, think men right. need our, to understand our, our their psychological are, health. Yeah. yeah, they need to understand their psychological health on a whole new level and, 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 and start thinking differently about it. Like, like not, it doesn't have to, they don't have to think about it in a pathological sense. They can right. think about it more in a creative sense. And that's definitely my work and the work I've been, you know, with the alchemy of man and the work I'm attempting to, um, to bring into the world. And, and so we're on the same page, man. I really appreciate what you're doing. Sure. And I hope everyone can um, contribute their understanding of what we've just talked about and build on that conversation because it's a bloody important conversation it's one of the well, the other thing i want to say Sal, thank you for that note for the for the acknowledgement i think the other thing i want to say is we're building a group not only of people who are like interested in watching me um or watching what we do but also a group of people who might want to bring their own power skills or interest into uh assisting moving some of these conversations forward we call them the ccia yeah. Uh, basically, it's called, they're called creative. Um, the the comedy CIA, and um, so these are the say it again. It just say that again. Conversation, conversation creators in action. The CCIA. Conversation creators in action. Oh, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. Right. Right. So these are people who can come aboard, and they might be have some super skill or some interest or some history of wanting yeah. to make a difference with us and we can use you know we can use that skill to make sure that as you yeah. hop on board that you're utilizing what it is you want to use to make a difference in the world yeah fantastic fantastic i like that fred thanks very much for your time i really Thank appreciate you. it um yeah. dr fred moss welcome to humanity.net dot net. net welcome yeah. to humanity.net check it out follow fred and um and everyone listening to this like find your place in this conversation and, and let's move the needle because it's, it's a really important needle to move. Um, great talking to you, Fred. I look Thank forward you. to our next chat. Really great time. Thanks so much. The introduction of Prozac as a medication. It changed everything about psychiatry. From being a communication field, it became a chemical imbalance field, a field called biological psychiatry. And each time I wrote a prescription or diagnosed somebody, my heart broke or my soul sacrificed. So in 2006, I had had enough and I started changing. I started taking people, the lower risk patients off their medicines and lo and behold, they got better, way better. Then I started taking people off their diagnosis because they no longer had the criteria met. And those people also got better. And I began to discharge people out of my outpatient practice who knew that they no longer had a psychiatric condition. I replaced things with creativity, art, music, dancing, singing, drama, cooking, writing, gardening, were some of the replacements that, that actually disappear the negative symptoms or the negative experiences that we have in our life. So uh, today is September 9th, uh, 2019, and I just feel so honored and so pleased to be with Kelly Brogan. Kelly and I was just having a pre-conversation about this meeting that we're having today. And uh, at some level, Kelly said that there may be like one activist in this country that is carrying on as a psychiatrist in the world of uh, really taking a look at a par the necessary paradigmatic shift that's required in order to maybe turn the psychiatry thing on its ear and, and bring mental health back to where it's supposed to be. And uh, she said there might exactly be one. I'm assuming that one is me, and I'm not sure. I was sure thinking of you, and then, I, and then Bregan. We got <laughs> Right, get Peter Bregan and, and Peter Bregan and um, the, the three of us. And we have to look far and long for other people who are 
taking a stand like this. And for you psychiatrists who are out there who are taking a stand, welcome aboard. And um, really just come aboard. Can't wait to meet you and talk with you and learn more about what you're up to. So welcome to the conversation, Kelly. It's really, really fabulous to see you. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I'm super excited to, yeah. to be such a like mind. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I have, uh, I had the opportunity in preparing for this conversation to read at least the start of your book. I'm going to admit that I haven't read the whole thing. And I was immediately just entranced with it and really just, um, I can't wait to can't wait to get right back to it after our interview here. So tell me a little bit about what you're doing with your life now and what led you to write this book and, you know, what kind of impact is, um, have you been making or been being made on you that has you see that this is the time for this book to be released? Yeah. So, you know, requires a little rewind because I wrote a book in 2016 called A Mind of Your Own. And I did that because I had had a, a, my own encounter with the, the medical system through the diagnosis of an autoimmune condition that is sensibly chronic. And I just didn't want to take a prescription for the rest of my life, despite the fact that I had been writing them, you know, left and right, including to pregnant and breastfeeding women as a reproductive psychiatrist. And so I, um, I began to examine many of the kind of sacred cows in um, medicine, but chiefly in psychiatry. And it, it led me to Robert Whitaker's work and led me to put down my prescription pad for good. So in 2010, I never, since 2010, I've never written a prescription for a patient, a new prescription uh, for a patient and dedicated myself to tapering. I was really angry though. I, I had a no small amount of, of righteous rage, not only because I had never encountered uh, any of the studies, for example, in anatomy of an epidemic in my training, and I've, I've been on PubMed, you know, like I, I'm very comfortable with it. I've always been interested in primary literature, and, and I never read those studies, and I certainly was never told you could heal a chronic illness. That's not even, it's not even put on the menu of options or possibilities or potentialities in, in allopathic medicine, where the goal is simply just management, right? right. And so I thought, I'm going to put all this science into this book, um, talk about how I healed myself and how I'm applying this to my patients, and no one's ever going to touch a medication again. That's right. literally what I thought was going to happen. Right. Because uh, I thought it was just a matter of information, right? Right. What I learned is that there is something much more nuanced going on, and I think it has to do with foundational beliefs and the ways in which those beliefs interact with our health care, right? And our self-care and our disease care. And so what I found is that the, the testimonials of, of healing that came from a mind of your own, so people just read a book, did what was in the book, um, were not explicable through just transmission of information. I mean, this is like, you know, people who had been diagnosed bipolar for 25 years who came off of meds and were done with their psychiatrists. And th to me, that information couldn't possibly have achieved that. So what happened there? What I now, in retrospect, you know, many years later and having scaled this protocol to thousands of people online and continued in my practice, what I've come to understand is that the information in that book simply validated the intuition that was very, very buried in those individuals that they could in fact transform this pain into power. Mm -hmm. And that validation is what ignited their own innate healing process, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's not about convincing anyone or changing minds. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I, you know, I see myself potentially as um, not only a gatekeeper, you know, to the pharmaceutical realm so that I can do what I can to make sure that informed consent is possible, you know, that, that people know about the untold story of these medications, both in terms of limited efficacy and adverse effects, but that also, you know, people have these very, very basic tools to support and validate their inner sense that there is something better out there for them, that there is life beyond psychiatry available to them. And so a lot of what I have foregrounded is not only, you know, how to walk this path, potentially some of the road, road signs, but also these stories, you know, I think we need to know what's possible in order to know what we, what we desire for ourselves. Right. That's beautiful. So 
I, I guess what I'm hearing you say is that something gets unleashed in these people to get that there's already innately something that's all that's pre-existing that yeah. offers the possibility of healing anyways and that it's almost like a lifting or a non-doing a, a, an unveiling of uh, what the psychiatric field or what the psychiatric prevailing conversation has brought their way. Exactly. And, I, you know, I like to say that, that <clears throat> despite our best efforts, you know, scientifically, technologically, medically, you know, there are many things that are, are complex that we do not know how to engineer, right? So we don't know how to engineer healthy soil, right? We don't know how to grow, you know, in a forest ecosystem. Mm -hmm. We simply know how to create conditions and frankly, as you said, get out of the way. So I think a lot of what um, healing consists of and radical mm -hmm. healing, I've taken a great interest in, in radical healing that defies the dogmatic assumption that chronic disease is a given. Um, mm -hmm. that the conditions for that are surprisingly basic, surprisingly simple, but that the most important ingredient is the mindset, is the belief that this is possible and almost that it's an entitlement, right? So, so you're going to get that no matter what. So that posture I found is um, it cannot be you know, replaced and it's an essential piece of these, these stories. You know, you're speaking with, thank you very much. It's, it's really quite beautiful what you're up to. And it's a, a, uh, it really is a deep honor to be having this discussion with you. And there's a new level of what I'm hearing that um, there's an alignment with the times that has you being very comfortable speaking to uh, your life's work here. That, uh, uh, well, maybe comfortable is a little overstatement, but, but having you be... Um, courageous or proud or bold enough to take a stand in this area that really flies against what is otherwise the default prevailing conversation. Can you say something about how, you know, your, I'm sure you get uh, equated to fearlessness in some, some occasions, either being fearless or courageous or bold or strong or, you know, alternative. What is it, Kelly, that for you has you being able to stand, you know, calmly, and firmly and compassionately inside of this stand that actually does fly against the um, ongoing prevailing conversation that may, may be subject to some transformation, uh, quite mm -hmm. honestly, um, in, in the present paradigm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that I, I have a, a program from childhood um, that is, is quite defiant. Um, you know, and, and doesn't take anyone's word for it. Right. And so, you know, that comes from arguably, uh, probably relatively common wound. Um, and, and so this program is what led me ultimately to begin when I was pregnant, um, in 2000, well, it would have been 2008, um, to, to begin to question some of the things that my OB was telling me about at mm. that point. Right. And so I said, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm going to do this my own way. I know how to read studies just as well as you do, if not better. You know, it's like this kind of like yeah, know yeah. it all. It's a no, the know it all of my, my shadow um, that actually has served me for some time because it's led me to investigate for myself. And what I discovered, particularly when it started to come to my own health, I never had any health related de dealings or doings until pregnancy and postpartum. Um, I think I, I simply learned a different version of the truth. And my mentor in later years, Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez, you know, he, he always said to me, Kelly, your only job is to love the truth. And I never mm. really knew what he meant by that. Wow. Um, but these days, you know, I, I feel his, he's, he's passed and I feel his presence and I feel like that's what I'm doing. You know, I, I was in a position when I was still very entrenched in my programs and, and my unexamined wounds. And before I'd really gone through the dark night of the soul in my personal awakening process, I was very entrenched in this concept of fighting, right? This idea of fighting the system. And we're so enculturated around warfare. I mean, look at the names of our medications, antidepressants, antihypertensive, antibiotic. It's just like, you know, rallying to, 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 to get the big bad enemy out there. And yeah. so of course we have no understanding 
of the possibility, the quantum, you know, physics perspective that out there is simply a mirror of in here. Yes. So, so quit fighting because you're, you're literally warring against yourself. And so what I've come to in, in healing that within myself and understanding that, you know, I can fight this all day long, but in the end, I'm still going to be at war. So, so how are we going to, how are we going to heal collectively? How are we going to resolve this one and all? And I, I came to understand, well, I'm going to love what feels good to me. I'm going to, 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 to choose to love a reality that allows for healing, a reality that makes room for the meaning of crisis and illness and grief and, and, and struggle, right? And, and I'm going to inhabit that reality and do everything I can to support its existence simply because it feels safer for me in the world to do that. So I don't know that I would identify it as like courageous or fearless. It, do, no. it doesn't feel that way to me. It just simply feels like I need, um, I need to live in a world where this kind of healing is possible. And I know that it is because I've seen it. So how can I amplify and support that? Because it's the world I want to live in. It's the world I want to raise my children in, you know? So it's really more about that than it is about winning against the old model. The old model, like you, you know, it's never going to leave me. It's in me. I was trained by it, right? So, so I can't pretend like I'm not even still using some of the tools of the trade within myself, within my, you know, psychology, and and I'm forever lashed to to the allopathic system. So I'm not gonna pretend that it's this horrible bad thing that I need to kill, because it's a piece of me too. But yeah. I am going to, to try and nurture and grow this other side of me um, that you know is, is more yin, it's more soft, it's more receptive, and it's certainly more curious as a reflex rather than controlling. So yin and soft and receptive and curious and in the word you used earlier is safe. It's, uh, it's really fascinating as I listen to you because I really relate to all of that. It's like it doesn't appear for me to be that I'm rogue or that I'm um, uh, courageous or bold or you know taking on the system. It actually, I love what you said about safety that this world, when I can take into consideration that all of the, that there is space for pain, for emotional discomfort, for depression, you know, for anxiety or for confusion, for aimlessness, for uh, misery, like all of those things as part of the grand human experience, then I get to expand myself and in fact, live into that truth. Yes. And when I bring out that to my, I don't even know that when I'm speaking that way as an MD or as a psychiatrist, it's having some, um, I really don't know as I'm doing it that it's having some kind of large impact over there. I, 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 it's almost like, well, that's good because I would do it anyways. And yeah. there's, something, there's, there's something about learning this and being with it. Really, really beautiful. What is... Um, you know what, I, I have my answers to this from my field or from, from my perspective, but I'm wondering from you, like what are some of the hurdles that you're running into? What are some of the pushbacks? What are some of the things that in fact, if you really at the end of the day, you look at them, you're like, yeah, this is, that's substantial. You know, what's yeah. in your way? Hmm. Yeah, so, you know, when I published my first book, there was a, a totally, um, impenetrable mainstream media blackout. I was with a top five publisher at the time. You know, they handed out the galley to the Today Show and Dr. Roz and all Nightline and whatever. And they literally got back, no, 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 no. And then even from, I think it was ABC, they got back, if we were to allow your author on, it would be bad press for both of you. So that didn't surprise me, of course, with 70% of, of media subsidies coming from pharma, you know, that's only to be expected. And I certainly wasn't surprised by that. Um, there has been, since then, like I've been largely ignored, which is fine with me because it's sort of like, okay, I'm going to create, as Bucky Fuller says, like, don't fight the system from within it you know, create something that makes it obsolete. So, okay, so I'm working over here, you know, on, on my thing. What in the publicity for, for Own Yourself for this current book um, has been kind of like jarring for me and unexpected. Um, 
is that even in wellness communities, spiritual communities, um, yoga communities, that I'm encountering resistance. I mean, I did an interview with one of the biggest, you know, celebrity wellness platforms out there um, that will remain unmentioned sure. um, last week. And literally it was the most contentious interview I have ever done in my career. It was, wow. it was frankly adversarial. The wow. editor that I was uh, being interviewed by was, she took, um, such issue with so many, she all had all the page numbers out of all the things that I mentioned in this book about that, that just questioned basic dogmatic assumptions around, you know, science and, uh, and even in, in the realm of psychiatry, like the role potentially of medications in the Parkland shooting, you know, this kind of stuff. And I, you know, I recognize in that moment, um, that it's really not, again, same message. It's not about information because I am still in the allopathic mindset. A lot of the time I have, um, you know, the science cataloged in my mind defensively, right? So when you come up against the consensus, when you come up against a status quo, you're far more adept at, at recruiting, you know, science and, and, and your, your intellect in service of this, this new story, right? So I have it all. I can defend every single statement I make with published literature. And, and I have a staff of, of med students and clinical volunteers who help me to write up these cases. We just published another one um, yesterday on Graves' disease, you know, just because I, I'm still in the world where that matters, you know, where the yeah. science matters, it's a currency of exchange. But I was able to see, wow, you know, this, this platform um, can't go there. They can't go there. They can't go to the place that allows us to question what we've been told about genetics and disease and even bigger concepts, you know, introducing quantum biology. They just need it to be smaller and more familiar. And I was there in my past. I get that, you know, but it's sort of, it's dissonant when it's even in this, this, these burgeoning communities that say they advocate for, you know, self-care and personal responsibility. And I think a big piece of it is recognizing the, how entrenched we are in our victim mentalities, right? Mm -hmm. That then we all are. I mean, I spot one in my life every day where I'm, I'm telling a little story about poor Kelly, right? Mm -hmm. And, and it just is part of our, this moment, I think we find ourselves in where we're like, are we going to grow up now? Right? Like, is it time to adultify? Because fundamentally on a psychological level, transitioning from that victim mentality is perhaps the initiation into adult consciousness. And it requires personal responsibility and that could be so uncomfortable. Yeah. I love that word, right? Because it's, right. it's, it's responsibility, right? It's, it's so that you're no longer reacting from fear and, and recapitulating these past patterns that might have helped you as a kid. But honestly, as an adult, they're keeping you stuck and in fear, in perpetual fear. So how can we cultivate this response ability so that we can interact with what is from a place of groundedness and, and really locate that, that sort of nexus of control within ourselves? And that's what it is to become an adult, but I'm not sure we have many models for that culturally. Right, right. Um, so again, a, a completely beautiful answer. My follow up goes something like this. I, uh, I, I also completely resonate with that experience, number one. So and, and number two, there's like, it's just like jaw dropping when I bring this to who I know to be advanced thinkers yes. who are on the cutting edge of so many different things and ready to take on what it is to be an evolved human, or what it is to be free and capable and functional and making a difference like a transformation in the world around us and you know grouping up and as global citizens and uh hitting third world nations and you know like uh sustainability and this is who they are this is who they really are i yeah. know them to be this and then br bringing this conversation into that land sometimes is just a massive slingshot out of it yes um, uh, and it's like Wow, wow, this is really a deeply entrenched way of being that 
must work at some level. It must work because these people are pretty good, at least in my world, of undoing things that weren't, didn't work for them. And now they're, they're taking on new ways of looking at things in different realms. But in this one, it's the carve out. It, it really hangs on. It really does. So people like, you know, um, especially in the diet, I have found myself more recently calling myself non-diagnosing rather than non-diagnosing and non-medicating. Um, and I, I find that. this, you know, it's like I no longer diagnose. So I don't just put down my prescription pad. Now I've also I put down that. any kind of diagnoses. Awesome. I love that. Right. It has a lot of implications. It has a lot. And it's way easier. It's way easier. Then I don't have to be anti-pharmacological either because yes. it isn't really about that. What's there to treat if there's no diagnosis? No, no problem. Thank you. Thank and there's, you. yeah, no stigma either, by the way, because there's nothing to be stigmatized. It's all great. You know, you are who you are. And people seem to like it conceptually, completely amused by it. Like but people in practice, are, yeah. But in practice with their family or themselves, there's like, there's a, a, a massive, a massive pushback still. That's the bait and switch I've observed around this system, you know, because there is something very validating. Okay, so, so we are all walking around with this deep, dark belief, I think based on, you know, childhood experiences, that, that something's wrong with us. Yeah, right. Right, like we're all hiding that secret belief like something wrong with me in the yeah. world of us you mean exactly right? exactly okay, yeah. I got that. And, I, and i hope that i can keep the mask up so that nobody ever finds out right yeah. like i hope i can curate my traits um or be self-deprecating in an artful enough way or whatever so that nobody sees just how broken and damaged and even sick i am yes. right and so when you sit in that chair and you get that diagnosis from your your priest or priestess physician you know it's 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 something of um, like an anointment huh and it's validating right because they're saying yes you're right something is wrong with you and not only that it's always been wrong with you and it always will be it's so the best right. you can do is to, is to manage it and so there is a moment where it feels you feel seen, mm -hmm. right? But what happens is when you habituate around that dynamic, not only are you obviously dependent literally and figuratively on this uh, clinician, mm -hmm. you, you become dependent on their a transitional object, on that, on that uh, medication, literally, chemically, and otherwise. Yes. But what happens is that you, you identify in that, again, childlike posture of authority outside yourself. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of the bait and switch of it is that there is no um, way for you to both assert yourself authority agency and to actualize an adult and remain a patient. They're incompatible, yes, yes. which is why you're trying to liberate people from even the labels, right? And you're saying, I'm not going to participate in that. But there's yes. some part of them that feels like, well, then how do I know what's wrong with me? I know exactly. something's wrong with me. Exactly. Uh, and, and the truth is, like, how do we begin to, to I guess, uh, relume a, a sense that there's meaning in what we understand to be our our undesirable parts, the weird things that our you know body does, the ways that we respond that are, are embarrassing to us, our anger, our shame, our rage, you know, like our sadness. Like, how do we begin to turn towards our particular brand of that, our particular signature around that, and finally make peace with it? It's the most difficult work, and very few people are doing it. But the people who I think get captured by the system, psychiatry, who get captured are exquisitely sensitive individuals. And in my opinion, are some of the most powerful mm -hmm. and, and, and important at this moment in time that their particular impact as visionaries, as healers, as artists, as creatives has never been more needed right to begin to fully dismantle this system that has run its course that is predicated on straight lines ones and zeros and you know bad and good we need those kind of fluid um as alan watts calls them the goos right so there's like the prickles and the goos and there's these different um kind of types of beings and so i think that these um highly sensitive folks are the ones who get captured and they get told 
this is what's wrong with you when what I've observed is that's actually the seat of their power. Exactly. Nobody's taught them how to use it. They have no guidance, no elders, you know, um, and no true validation that would say, yes, I know you feel pain and I know you feel disconnection and there's a way to transform that. There's a way to yeah. secure that under your, your own wings. Mm -hmm. Right. It's almost, you know, this idea of like uh, flipping it on its ear. The idea here is that the people, you know, the people who were calling abnormal or who were agreeing that the hospital or the system has captured, um, who are just pure in their, uh, the mismatch I think you speak of in your book, you know, this, this, this mismatch between what they know to be uh, necessary for their own soul and what's really going on in the outside. And this mismatch creates uh, some form of um, uh, expression that appears to be odd to the homogenous status yes. quo. Yes. Well, what happens, and it seems like what happens then is that see people get captured, get called abnormal, and then get, you know, uh, who knows what happened. It's not never, never very good what happens once captured. <laughs> right. um, and one of the things I'm hearing you say that I wonder, I'd like to hear your view on is this idea that we, um, maybe all 7.7 .7 billion of us actually go through a period uh, or, or in our early childhood and then maybe every day from then on, this idea of hiding what's wrong with us, knowing that there's something wrong with us and then followed up with absolutely being committed to making sure that nobody else sees what's wrong with us. So there's this combination of, Yes, there is something like completely strange and wrong about me. And I'm going to spend the rest of my life making sure that you and nobody else ever, ever sees that, whatever, whatever facade. If it could be gotten by everyone that that experience is in the essence of normalcy too, what would happen then is what I always wonder. You know, what if we all knew that we go through feeling profoundly abnormal as an absolute normal aspect of being a human. Like undoing that from its very soul, very heart that has people get that, oh, that means that all, everyone has this. And the answer is right. Every, actually, actually, it's one of the most universal, if not the universal, most universal emotional experience that we, we as humans all share. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think it, you know, you can look at it on a spiritual level, on a basic psycho psychological level, but I think that the experience of, un of, of conditional rather, of conditional love as, as children, right? So, so mm -hmm. whether, you know, it was an incest or, or acute violence or chronic neglect, or whether it was, you know, the way your, your mom made a face when you got a, a 68 on a math test, you know, um, there were many moments likely where we experienced conditionality of a primary caretaker's love, right? And we began to understand, oh, there are certain things I have to do. There are certain ways I have to be in order to feel love, which of course is an existential currency of, of survival to a child, right? And so that those adaptations, those defenses, those survival skills mm -hmm. on a personality level probably served almost all of us, right? So I have like this mercenary, I call it my mercenary program. It's a, it's a mercenary um, defensive structure where the moment I perceive that somebody might not agree with me, I'm like, forget it. I got this. Don't, I don't need you, you know? And I'm sure that that served me at points um, in my childhood where I could cultivate independence in moments I, I, I perceived I couldn't rely on my parents to provide me what I needed, right? And mm -hmm. protect myself. Yeah. So the, the, there is not a person who has escaped this. The only differences between us are our defensive structures and how we have found ways to navigate our, um, you know, projected expectations of others in our adult life. But the interesting twist is that we have the capacity to parent ourselves, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's more than just a capacity. It may be 
kind of the point of life, you know, mm -hmm. to come to this experience of unconditional love, not through another, through a partner mm -hmm. who's going to adore you till death do you part, mm -hmm. um, not through your own child, right? Mm -hmm. But actually through your relationship to the, the mosaic of you, right? Mm -hmm. and, and this is kind of the, it's what I refer to as like the holofractal nature of reality, where if we can create the conditions for that, where the moment you do something that you're like, why the hell did I do that? The moment you do that, you say, it's okay. It's okay. I forgive myself. Right. Yeah. And you, and you learn to mean it, right. It's from a simple practice like that to beginning to understand the weird, interesting and unique ways that you interact with reality right? Beginning to see your triggers, beginning to see your habits, beginning to see the ways that you abandon yourself and violate yourself in service of others, all of these things. It can become this process of self-discovery that I actually believe then um, creates something like Rupert Sheldrake would call a morphic field for possibility um, collectively, right? And so it's like this, yes, it's time to do our own work. It's time to heal in this way and generate the experience of unconditional love as individuals, but that is also healing the collective. And that's also really the only thing we can offer this, this planet that is, my gosh, what we are up to, right? Like, and, and that's why I love you know, Krishnamurti's quote where he says, um, it's no sign of health to be well adapted to a profoundly sick society because right. we are on, you know, this planet is on her deathbed and and how are we going to respond? You know, I have a friend, philosopher Charles Eisenstein, who says the only thing that convinces an ailing relative to stay instead of exit is love, right? So, so how do we really show that? But we can only show it to the planet, to others, to the capacity that we can feel it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why, you know, whenever we feel sensitive to the judgment of others, um, Odds are it's a, it's a metric of how much of that own self, our own self judgment is still active. And so, you know, finding a, a path to healing that I think begins with an unmedicated consciousness and begins with, you know, kind of turning towards oneself in a way that says, whatever you're feeling, whatever you're doing, it's got to mean something and I'm going to figure it out. Right. Meaning to yourself. Right. Yeah. Beautiful. I, I really, really astonishing. I wonder if there's also uh, just a space for this, what I like to call the second derivative of what you're talking about, which is to get also that when I'm judging myself, even that's okay. It's like being totally. care you know, yes. it's a being meta, careful like... to get the next level as well. Yes. Uh, and yeah. then being able to embrace that. Exactly. I love that you brought that up because what can happen is, especially in the like holistic health world of nutrition and lifestyle practices and all these things that we can be doing to make ourselves better and healthier, um, it's really, really critical. I call it kind of discipline without judgment. It's really critical to both exercise your choice, um, recognize and acknowledge you know, the power of your will and commitment, and then simultaneously do it without an agenda, right? Because yeah, what yeah. can happen is as we're healing, um, it's, it, we can sort of see it as, as some linear progression towards godliness or something, right? And right. what happens is then you're judging your past and previous iterations. And then of course, anyone who reminds you of your own past self, you're gonna judge, right? So for me, that would be like really stark, right? So I, I judge my previous prescribing psychiatrist self. And then it, naturally, anytime I meet um, a psychiatrist or clinician who believes what I did, I'm going to judge them too. And that yeah. serves no one, right? And it, 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 it traps me in a world of not only direct judgment, but as you're describing meta judgment of my judgment, because now I'm aware of the toxicity of judgment. So it's this recursive um, effort to allow everyone to be who they are and recognize that my only responsibility is to find okayness what, with, with what is, with what I am, 
Mm -hmm. um, and to learn to actually find meaning in it. You know, I like to say that suffering ends where meaning begins. It, it really is true. If you can frame your process of whether it's, you know, terminal cancer or, you know, a, a, a diagnosis of OCD, you know, if you can frame that with um, a different narrative that is more kind of peace oriented, you know, towards your own experience, then you'll find that your nervous system literally on a physiologic level stays in regeneration, mm -hmm. doesn't flee into to fight, flight, freeze, and, and that you have this capacity to cultivate that watching eye, that meta consciousness that allows you to interact with what is from a place of you know, dispassion from a place of neutrality, from a place of okayness. There's always that little voice that's saying, wow, gosh, what's happening now? This is interesting. And it's a totally right. different way of being. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's great. So one of the, you know, a lot of life is, life is funny. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> in summary. <laughs> and, and last night and this morning, and I, I'm, I'm staying in a really exquisite, an exquisite place in Vermont now. And I am um, staying with an, it was a, a truly extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinary human being uh, for the week that I'm lucky to be in the, um, uh, first of all, in the same earth with, but let alone in his house with him. I love it. Really, really beautiful. quite beautiful, quite beautiful. And so um, some of the conversations that I've had recently have been about these words about manifestation, uh, law of attraction, mm -hmm. Uh, vibrational states, um, you know, this idea of really already having everything I want all the yeah. time, yeah. all the time, including when that, that what shows up is actually what I'm calling for to show up, including pain and misery. Like yeah. that's what's next. Yep. Yes. So the opportunity, you know, what, as we have this conversation, we might, while we're on it, that we're just kind of having a conversation, but we're have this is an interesting vibrational conversation between two contemporary psychiatrists yes. after all yes and the impact of this is is entirely un as this stone gets thrown into the river it's very unclear what the level of impact it is not only what has led us to be on this call but then what gets created as a result of you and i meeting on this call is very fun for me to just fantasize about like what is you know what what is the manifestation that has you and i um uh, speaking to this new nature of well it's not even new it's it's, it's speaking to the almost the old nature old, of what yeah almost yeah um the remembrance yeah i am um... I love this word. I learned recently anamnesia. It's a Greek word. Maybe you know it. And, and my understanding is that it, it, it refers to the remembrance of something once known. Oh, and that's, that's kind of, I think, the feeling that many of us are having. They, and of course, it's being dubbed an awakening process, or something of a zeitgeist right now. But it's, it's like you, you sort of were like, is it new? Is it old? I think it's that feeling like, like that validation that we, we have the capacity given our credentials to provide individuals, you know, we can help them to remember what they've always known, which is that they're perfect. They're perfect. Exactly. Literally like, perfect. Literally it's perfect. Not some spiritual bypassy no. nonsense that it's, it's, it's a, it's a worldview that allows for there to be emergent beauty in the exquisite design of the balance and totality of all of the reality that we we perceive and i love what you said in fact that you'll find that that sentiment in the book um to be from my best friend actually tara who said that to me one day i was complaining about i don't god knows what like you know this house i couldn't sell or whatever and and she said you know i believe that we if you don't have something it's because you don't actually want it exactly right you know? I was like, what are you talking about? I've been, you know, praying for this for years. And, and you know, that was the, my superficial reaction. But of course, deep down, there were reasons that I wasn't ready to deal with what would come. You know, it's like Rilke says, I, I bastardize all these quotes. But, you know, it's like, you won't get the answer until you, you can 
properly live it. You know, like there, there is, a, a, if you want to call it a divine timing or, or some kind of um, really deeply meaningful unfoldment. And I think when we can get beyond the egoic echo chamber of our own childlike fears and, and, of course, this is in the realm of mystical experiences that people have, and, and many people in the, in the world of, of psychiatry are natively um, predisposed to having. And of course, that gets um, you know, sort of put in, in the, the psychotic box. But once you, you enter into that realm, what do people come back and say? They come back and, and, and report a level of connectedness um, yeah. a level of design and incredible mm-hmm. awe-inspiring beauty mm-hmm. to the simple fact of being right to the privilege of, of experiencing this this human mystery and so that's where we can see oh wow the suffering comes from the story we're telling ourselves about what's happening and there right? is no inherent suffering it's right. only suffering because we we say it is bad and we've been enculturated and conditioned to believe that it's bad. Uh, but that's really, you know, what folks who are, are, are taking control of their health experiences and reclaiming themselves from psychiatry, that's the work they're doing. You know, they, they are showing us a different type of reality, a different way of relating um, to, to struggle and um, uniqueness even, you know, to their yeah. particular their signature and and it's so important right now you know the uh there was a there was a doctor when i was in i uh i i think it was fourth year medical school it may have been my first year of residency there was this man who showed up with wild hair and he was he sh- i think it was in cincinnati so i'm pretty sure it was uh pretty sure it was fourth year medical school and he showed up with our with the people who were in a psychiatry rotation and he was talking about that he was a soothsayer. He mm. knew the world. He knew the way the world was about to go. And he almost showed up like a Back to the Future kind of man yes. who was like, "You need to watch me because what I'm telling you is how this is going to go." And he sa- actually said all sorts of things about HMOs and about PPOs and about medicines and about how everything's about to change. And now I want to, you know, I would love to meet this man again because he <laughs> tapped into sure, something. Sure, he tapped into something. And one of the things he brought up was an extremely, well, apparently simple, uh, reductionistic mathematical mathematical equation that he felt was the source of most psychological pain. And that was, uh, the, the equation was something like D, D equals the difference between R and E. And what that meant was that the depression or discomfort equals the distance between reality and expectations. And that when those and that that's an easy equation that yes. when re, when what's going on is yes. in fact consistent with what you thought should be going on exactly. then depression has no place actually no symptoms have no place all that's left then is being okay with what's so yes exactly and then the proportionality of what occur, like the distance between how you think things should be and how now you are experiencing them is the further thing? that is the more pain and uh, discomfort you're likely to experience. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I've, I've taken a very deep dive into Byron Katie's work. I don't know Mm -hmm. if you know her work and, you know, it's exactly that. I mean, she would, would argue and changes, you know, people's lives in one 20 minute conversation. I've been to her workshops. All she does is help people to make peace with reality. Right. And to stop it should be different and she'll say you know how you know it shouldn't be different like if i'm all disgruntled that my my partner's not doing the dishes right and she'll say you know how we know he shouldn't be doing the dishes because he's not doing the dishes exactly right, right? <laughs> end of suffering so yeah it's the end of suffering and, and she applies this to you know to to prisoners of war and and people yes. who have had extreme experiences of heinous abuse and it's it's understanding that we always have choice we always retain choice and that that um, degree of of responsibility for what is unfolding which is our choice around either how to literally respond or even just how to internally respond is what gives us god creating powers right so 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 that a patient you know who who was you know in some sort of grandiose state 
having figured out the, the, the source and explanation for everything, right? Like if we had a culture that helped people to work with that kind of energy and it, through the development of a meta consciousness, right? Then he would be able to use that gift. He obviously has uh, obviously. To remain in control at the same time, right? Yeah. So it's something like, you know, in the plant medicine world, indigenously, exactly. you know, if a shaman is, is leading a, a ritual and a ceremony and drinks a plant medicine, he doesn't go nuts, right? He's not screaming and wildly running around. He's developed that meta consciousness that allows him to interact with these more mystical layers from a place of self-possession. Yeah. That is what, what we are asking, you know, um, uh, patients to do with no framework, no toolkit yes. and, you know, no, no holding. Right. So, right. So I think that this is a major shift that we are participating in and it's multi-layered, um, but it starts with coming in, you know, I personally, my bias is I think it starts with very basic low hanging fruit of like a physiologic foundation. Like how do you calm your nervous system down, you know, resolve brain fog and headaches and, you know, bloating and fatigue and insomnia and blood sugar imbalances and nutrient deficiencies. Let's just kind of like get that foundation strong so that you can see, you know, because I've had, I have one case through my online program of uh, treatment resistant schizophrenia and a young man. And in five weeks, he was on Clozeril and his mom was going to take him. I might've told you about this case. I just still can't believe it. His mom was going to take him to Switzerland for euthanasia. Uh, literally. No, no. Literally. And this woman is one of the most compassionate, loving yeah. individuals I've had the privilege of interacting with. Mm -hmm. And that's how bad it was for him. He was in a living hell on multiple medications from when he was in his early teens. And in five weeks of dietary change, he is now, I think he's almost completed his final medication taper. He volunteers, he stopped smoking, you know, he's in the world in a way that she never imagined, he never imagined was possible, right? So to my mind, you know, when it's that dramatic, we might be just dealing with something that there are probably 200 plus medical references on, which is the role of, of you know, gliadin or, or wheat containing proteins in brain inflammation, right? So it might not be some spiritual walkabout you have to go on, but let's sort of like first chop wood, carry water, and make sure that, that you know how to, to ease your system before we understand what your particular journey is meant to be. But there's some reason that it's expressing in you in this way, and how can you turn toward it and begin that investigative process? Mm -hmm. Just awesome. Awesome, Kelly. Really, really great. So I know you're um, running up against it a little bit in time, and I have a, a couple more questions that I want to ask you. What, the, the obvious one is like, what's next for you? Like, where, where, are, we, where are we going? Where we, and can I come along? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Yeah. I mean, so, so it's, it's interesting, and, and I'm, I know that you can, you agree already um, and can relate. But, you know, I found that we're kind of at the end of an era and, and that era is sort of like the master guru, the doctor patient, uh, the external authority. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that we have to go it alone, um, that there's this kind of paradox, like, yes, there's work you have to do, but you can do it with like minds. And so I, I saw the power of community when I had, you know, I have this 30 day protocol, very basic. Um, I worked with, uh, in my practice, one-on-one -on -one with patients, this same protocol, and then it took the same exact protocol and put it online, except the only difference was that there is a community, mm -hmm. Facebook community, right? And so the outcomes that we get, we get continue to get from Vital Mind Reset, my, uh, the online version of my private practice, literally make it look like I'm doing something wrong in my private practice, right? So it's like a real ego blow because it's like the more contact somebody has with me, the slower the outcomes, the more limited they are relative to, to this online space where there's really no direct contact with me awesome. and the, the community. So that was very sobering to me. And, you know, the, the program is for serious, um, you know, sort of recovery processes, right? Yeah. So it's not for everybody. So we created 
kind of a baby steps version. So again, if that's the yang, then the yin is, is this month to month membership, low cost membership we created called Vital Life Project. That's for people who just kind of want to dip a toe in, or maybe they're not ready for whatever is on the other side of the tidal wave of their transformational portal through this month, right? And maybe they just want to sort of like slowly, slowly dip a toe in. And I found, you know, we're a couple of months into this, and this is meant to be the companion community to this book, um, that, wow, again, Kelly learns a lesson. It doesn't need to be this deep dive, hardcore, like go big or go home, which is kind of my personality, right? That in fact, we're having dramatic, you know, um, feedback of people sort of finally feeling like they're in this safe place, finally seeing, you know, the ways in which they were struggling to fix themselves, now kind of understanding that they just have to learn what their basic needs are and respond to those with loving attention, right? Uh, from this membership where we just do one little lifestyle hack challenge, you know, like go to bed at 9 p.m. a week per month. That's all we're doing. But it's a community of people who fundamentally believe in this mission. And so I think that... Um, I don't know. I almost envision it. It's like, it's like we're, we're slowly recognizing that we're all part of one big organism, right? And that the every man or woman for herself, you know, or aligning with our team and fighting the rest, like that that's not serving us, right? It's like the cancer model of, of the meta-organistic, um, organismic biology. And so it's like, okay, so we're recognizing we're different cell lines and different tissue types. And how can we find our type? right? Like our resonant, um, you know, our resonant frequencies, like how can we come together and say, oh, you're a liver cell too. Me too. Awesome. And that doesn't mean that the heart cells are wrong. It just means right. they're another organ and, and good that they stay there. Right. So I kind of see that, that happening and, um, you know, and, and, and I, I feel that there is a growing energy for this mission while there is also tremendous resistance and that's yes. the nature of it. It's the nature of it. So how can someone how can someone get uh, more other than picking up this book and and uh, tell us a little bit about the book just so people will know that what you just wrote and you know it seems like it's your opus anyways for now and so uh, yeah hopefully it's a mic drop for a while because talk about a spiritual process writing a book is uh, can can bring your ego to its knees for sure um, so yeah so it's called own yourself it's out um, September seventeenth and um, I'm hoping to you know, really just equip people with a toolkit for navigating the dark night of the soul, but also specifically um, navigating, you know, sort of a non-medication based lifestyle in general. So there's like tips and tricks about how to, how to work with UTI symptoms, you know, without taking an Good. antibiotic. It's very broad based um, perspective on, on, on living more fearlessly and working towards that on a physical level, you know, to a spiritual level. And, um, and yeah, so that's, so that's available. And then the rest of my offerings are on kellybroganmd.com. And I'm just so really um, blessed to, to be able to have this kind of conversation. It's, it's been quite an isolated journey for me. Um, and, and I've been okay with that. But as I come into contact with more and more of my you know, unmet needs, I see, well, you know, it's really not, not been okay. You know, ultimately yeah. I was feeling myself against that, um, seeming reality. So I'm, I'm very grateful for your support and, and our shared mission. Thank you. So yes. Is there any, uh, any kind of, um, events or anything else happening for you? Is there any conferences or webinars or courses, or are you kind of going to lay low for a little while or how does someone contact you if they're interested in learning more about what you're up to? Yeah. So I am, keeping it mostly online. Um, and in fact, you know, I, I've dedicated my, my partner, Sarah and I have dedicated a lot of our attention to finding new, um, online platforms just in the current climate of Google censorship and, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram sort of being fundamentally at odds with a lot of what we're talking about here. So we're even investigating alternatives and there's a, in, in the holistic realm, you know, there's a lot of powerful, smart people who are going to yeah. come up with those alternatives. So I'm pretty excited about, you know, co collecting globally in ways that, you know, when I show up at a conference and there are a hundred people who've had to schlep across the country to be there, um, it's not available. So right. yeah, I can focus mostly on, on online offerings for now. Very great. Very great. 
All right, Kelly, it's uh, it's three minutes of the hour. I know that you have a hard stop. It's been a spectacular time meeting you. Um, I look forward to our next contact. I, I hope that it's very soon. I have some ideas I'd love to share with you about ways awesome. that we might be able to go in parallel or even together. Awesome. I love what you stand for. I really do. I love this book. I've had the opportunity to read uh, you know, some of it um, already, and I'm going to finish it here in the next day or so. Um, and I, I, I really love um, having a kindred spirit or someone who's really up to um, at least way close enough of a pathway. And however we got here was differently, but we're both here with eyes open. And so I really, really, really thank you for uh, not only validating where I am, but for being, uh, you know, front edge and, and so, in fact, so humble, vulnerable, available, and brilliant and uh, beautiful too. So thank you so okay. much for being exactly you. Thank you. Really, thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. We'll catch you on the next go around. Have a good afternoon. Thank you Kelly so Brogan, much. Kelly Brogan, folks. This is Kelly Brogan. Kelly Brogan's a psychiatrist who we've run into each other um, in the last couple of years, finally found out that we were both existent. And it's been a real, real pleasure interviewing Kelly today. And feel free to um, check either of us out if any of this is interesting to you. I'm at Dr. Fred at welcometohumanity.net. Kelly, what's your, any ways that they might be able to call you or email you? Sure. Uh, oh, the email? Yeah, it's just office at kellybroganmd.com. Okay, awesome. Perfect. All right. Have a great afternoon, Kelly, and a great week. Just a pleasure. Bye for now. Thank you. You're welcome. Ciao. Thank you. Authenticity is contagious, meaning that when you're authentic, you open up the space for the person you're with to be authentic with you. People sense authenticity. They really can feel it, and it opens up the space for them to open their heart in your presence. Not to mention, authenticity is actually more prized than agreement. <laughs> All right, so welcome, welcome, Joe Shirley. Today we is July twelfth, two thousand nineteen, and I want to tell the people who are watching this um, how excited I am to have you with me today. Um, Primarily, the goal of this interview is that I'm looking for spectacular people who are up to spectacular things in the world of treating or dealing with this notion of mental illness or this notion of mental, being mentally um, uncomfortable or having a mental diagnosis, emotional diagnosis. And I want to introduce you today as someone who I recently met only really a few weeks ago up in uh, Seattle, Washington, on my way back and forth to Victoria. And we had several beautiful conversations. And I got to learn a little bit of what you're up to in this world and how you got here. So I thought that the world should know a little bit about who you are and why not only I find you interesting, but why you're on the cutting edge of, of bringing a form of healing to the world that otherwise wouldn't be seen if we stayed on Main Street. So welcome to the interview, Joe. It's really great to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. So tell, tell us a little bit about who you are, how you got to be who you are, where you've been, and, and what put you in the place, and what do you do for a living? So I started out in Pennsylvania working class. Uh, my father's a cop, and uh, I had a chance to go to Ivy League school, was planning to do med school and all that kind of stuff. And uh, somewhere along the way, um, actually in Edinburgh, Scotland, it, it happened. I, I had my first sort of manic phases. Mm. And uh, for me, they were spiritual experiences. They were sort of a deep connected to, the, to everything kind of knowing. But I had no way of knowing what to do with that. And the, the conflict between having that and having no place to put it uh, sent me into pretty strong depression the following year mm. and that set up this continuing cycle of uh being super excited about having something really incredible to offer the world and the 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 challenge of there's no place to put it ah. so, well put very beautiful i got that yeah so um it was about uh seven years later uh, that after, I mean, a roller coaster ride of probably three dozen jobs, uh, a, a marriage and divorce, uh, a bunch of other relationships, 
it was clear, you know, that my life was was kind of a mess. Mm -hmm. um, I considered myself just simply a creative genius, and you know, beyond the constraints of the world. But a friend of mine uh, ha went to had a psychiatrist that she said, you know, maybe you ought to go see this guy. I read a book on manic depression. I was like, oh my god, this is me. Mm. I went. He said, uh, yeah, this is you. Mm. Here, take this lithium. Mm. And to be honest, there was, was that in the United States then was that, that here? Was, yeah, that okay. was in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, uh, um, yeah, I only spent a year in Edinburgh. Okay. So, uh, for in one way, the, the diagnosis was a wake up call. It was like, yes, there's something wrong here. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, it, it needs your attention. You can't just go skating, pretending everything's fine anymore. Second, because I had been, planning to go to med medical school and my interest was in consciousness and the brain, I knew a little bit of something about what the doctors didn't know, ah, right? I, I knew I enough that. to know they had no clue why lithium would do anything, what the consequences were, what actually bipolar disorder is. It's just basically a, you know, a description of patterns of people's experience. Right. So it's like, okay, I'm not going to assign my life away to a lifetime of medication based on that. And um, I, I dug in uh, through, uh, I, I trained in something called NLP, Neuro Linguistic yeah. Programming, mm -hmm. um, which is fascinating. I could say a lot about that. Yes. But uh, a piece of that, a small piece of that turned into seven years later, uh, a little experiment that I did with myself around my depression that enabled me to shift the feeling of depression rather dramatically and, and instantaneously mm. in a way that was completely unexpected to me. Mm. I now, was, in those years in between, you weren't taking medication. I were wasn't you just, taking medication. I was still, you know, life was cycling. Yeah, exactly. And just dealing with it, or was there? Just what dealing. were you doing? What were you doing as a way of self? You know, of just get, keeping track of yourself or keeping yourself, uh, uh, you know, capable of getting through each and every day. Well, for me. Um, one of the things that helped the most was having a, a livelihood that enabled me to be very, very flexible with my time. I, I became a, a freelance advertising copywriter. Okay. And so um, with the exception of the deadlines that I had to hit, I could work whenever I wanted. And I, you know, I would, I would do a job and bill for 20 hours. It would only take me seven hours to do it. And I would cram it in at the very end. And, and then I had, you know, these big chunks of time to just immerse myself in what was going on and try to figure out what was, what was driving this. And my, you know, the main, my main attention was going into my history and I had plenty of history to look at as the blame, you know, stuff with my father in particular. Um, but the work that I was doing, I, I did try therapy for a little while. Um, I was doing a lot of uh, the NLP stuff and self-hypnosis and journaling and uh, the stuff that I was doing, it felt like it was gradually clawing myself out of the cave, mm -hmm. um, but it was very slow going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And were, during that time, were you, were you doing some of the things that we now think are stabilizing? I'm sure you were eating well, exercising, uh, yeah. you know, uh, uh, finding yourself in nature, those kinds of things. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. 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 And what kind of affected, so when you were doing the more classical things, because I think in a moment here, we're going to hear what you really discovered for yourself. Mm -hmm. But when you were doing some of the therapies or some of the NLP or some of the, um, uh, you know, I suppose were you doing maybe even some, some mindfulness, some meditation and some creativity, are you saying that it was maybe getting better gradually or maybe you were finding some hope to clawing yourself out of the hole yeah is that right yeah. even before you discovered what it is you're about to tell us about yeah 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 for example um like one of my patterns you know i mean bipolar disorder is kind of a really simplification i was a mess in lots of ways so one of my patterns was getting drawn into relationships with married women who were married to uh what i perceived as jerks people like mm. my father. 
mm. and I would get involved with them and they would leave their husband for me and then I would leave them eventually. Wow. Yeah, mm. it was horrible. Wow. Um, so uh, when I turned 35, I said, okay, I'm taking a year. I am not so much as going on any kind of a date or anything mm -hmm. with anybody. I'm just going to watch the impulse. And, that, and the impulse was there. It was strong. There was this one woman that I had, was friends with. It was the classic shape of, of that, what would it, uh, attract me. I said no constantly. It was a mindfulness sort of, mm -hmm. I see this. I'm not acting on it. I'm going to just sit with it, be with it, pay attention to it, see if I can find out what's driving it. Mm -hmm. so, um, so stuff like that enabled me to sort of, you know, mitigate the, the effects. So I'm hearing a little bit of pattern, correct me if I'm wrong. So this idea is that you, you're, the struggle was consistently accompanied by a uh, intent or a wish or even a um, commitment to find out what's driving it. Like exactly. what's driving it became yeah. a yeah. really important question for you in all the areas that weren't working. Right, right. Yeah, around the time when I got diagnosed, around the time when I was staring at that lithium bottle every day before I threw it out, I had a, a sort of a, an inner intuition, a felt sense of there is a, it's almost like clockwork. There's something that is predictable about these cycles mm. that has to do with my inner process. Mm. And if I can just get to that and redirect it, I could stop this thing. I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. So we are two sets of seven years later and you're, what comes next for you? So I'm in, I'm in Montana and uh, that was a great getaway from Philadelphia. I sort of pulled a geographic. That was another strategy. Okay, everything's bad in, in Philadelphia. Maybe if I go out west, it'll get better. Right. You know, I was, you know, didn't work very well. Yeah, wherever you go. Then. It took me, it took me just, you know, like two weeks before I was involved with a, a married woman. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that sort of they thing. They have those in Montana as they well. Do, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> and it had nothing to do with geography. It was me. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. That, that was an inescapable realization there. Mm -hmm. um, so, but the, the day that I, that I, that I, discovered the little piece that it led to my work. Um, there was a, a, a sense of depression that felt like gravity pulling down on my heart. Um, that's, that's what it felt like. Mm -hmm. And I just asked the question to myself, what would happen if the gravity was pulling up instead? Wow. What would, th what would that be like? And I tried it on and whew, it just, it just, it transformed, it changed drastically and immediately and shocked the hell out of me so much so that um, I, I took like seven steps back um, yeah. because I had put so much effort into trying to figure out, okay, there's stuff in my history that creates the, my experiences here and it's all in my brain and all the rest of it. The idea that I could shift it like that instantaneously mm -hmm. meant all that effort was for nothing. That's how I interpreted it. Sure. Right. I wasn't willing to take that on. Right. You know, to 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 invalidate the my my hard work. Right. Right. So it took me a few weeks so before. Tell I, me tell me a little bit about this gravity pulling up. What is that? What is that? Give us a little bit of an idea. Are we you know gravity. We I think we all have gravity as a downward pulling force. What does that so, mean? To gravity pull up. Well, gravity just as in the sense of there's uh, an experience in my heart area. Mm -hmm. of a downward pull as if there's a downward pull specifically attached to that area of my body right yes and and then the question is what if that is pulling attached to the same place but pulling up instead okay all right all right yeah it's not really about gravity it's a, it's a localized force that was just in my in my being okay Okay, let's continue. Let's hear where right. this goes. So, um, so it felt like I, you know, there's something important here. At first, I thought, my God, you know, I could, I could, anytime I feel bad, just change it. Let's figure out how to how to do this. 
Um, so I developed a whole series of questions uh, that unpacked the felt experience of, of a feeling state. Uh, you know, the, the first one had location and a kind of force attached to it. I also added, um, you know, more specifically size and shape to the location, uh, temperature, color, substance quality, whether it seems like a solid, liquid, gas, light, energy, something else, um, movement, and sound. And so as I added these other dimensions and inquired into a feeling just by asking the question, it, you know, if, and using some of the hypnotic language that I had learned. So a standard question would be like, if you were to say that this feeling of, let's say it was depression, had qualities of substance, would you say it seems more like a solid, a liquid, a gas, etc.? Mm-hmm. Um, and so sometimes providing the, the choices for the mind to say, no, not that, no, not, oh yeah, that, ah. right? Mm-hmm. Some, and always providing the flexibility of, you know, you're just making this up, basically. If you were to say it was this, what would you say? We're not mm-hmm. saying that you are saying that it is that, mm-hmm. right? We're not locking you into this is reality. This isn't reality. Mm-hmm. This is you using the imaginative part of your brain to access something that's nebulous and formless. Okay. And what do you get back when you do that? Okay. All now right? you, you're talking about a general range of something I think I've heard you call feelings. Yes. Is this uh, uh, yeah. more than body sensations or more than emotions? We're really looking at the world of feelings. Is that correct? Yeah. The realm yes. of feelings. Okay. Exactly. So, yeah. okay. and that, that realm, you know, as I went into this, um, I started to discover some really weird things like feelings that were extended outside the body. Mm. Okay, so if it's if it's in the space, then it occupies like out six inches from the body, or it's above the head, or something like that. Well, what does that say about our ideas about feeling and emotion being sort of statuses of of physical embodiment, right? Yes. Okay. Um, yes. I also uh, started to notice that um, you know I would map, you know, ask these questions about a feeling state. And I noticed, oh, wait a second, this block here that's at the front of my chest, it's pushing against my chest. What's behind it? Oh my gosh, there's a little uh, a red fire, a flame behind it that's mm. being shut down by this block. Mm. So I started to recognize that there, there are dynamic uh, interrelationships between these different feeling entities. And with these questions, you could it's, it's like, it's almost like feeling is something that, if you were to compare it to other parts of the body, let's say bones dissolved as soon as you died. How would you study bones? Well, if you didn't have an x-ray, it'd be really tough, right? right. People learned about bones from dead people. So what happens uh, with feeling? We don't have a way of dissecting it. We don't right. have a way of examining it. Right. So what this gives you is that x-ray so you get to see, okay, what is this living feeling entity here, and and what's its what's you know what's its qual what are its qualities that, and it shows up really tangibly and precisely. I got it. So I'm wondering what you're saying. Let me let me try to recreate what you're saying to make sure that that I have it. It's sort of like. In the world of things that have matter or substance, one can see them even, for instance, in the world of of a body, one can see them in autopsy, one can see them in, uh, you know, dissection of the body, but feelings uh, really simply disappear and have no, there's no access to dissecting them or picking them out or looking at the various components that contribute to a particular feeling. Exactly. And because they're absolutely supremely private, there's no way for me to examine what you're feeling objectively so by giving it it, it the multiple dimensions yeah then we have a shot of getting your sense of your feeling over here to me exactly so there there's i you have a shot of getting your sense of your feeling over to me yes and comparing it to your sense of other feelings that you have Mm. right and comparing though the dynamic of that pattern of feelings with someone else's Mm. Right. You start to be able to actually do research on what feeling is. Mm. Okay. 
So tell us more. What happened? So I think we're. I think the the idea is here that you catch this for yourself, and soon you find yourself delivering or working with other people. As How soon as that? I started doing work with, as soon as I started exploring this with myself, I knew it was going to be easier for me to do it with someone else, because you know, facilitating your own stuff is it, it's got its challenges. Yeah. So um, right away, I was I was trying it out on whoever I could corral into letting me try it with them. Um, and I, I was, you know, surprised to see that other people could answer these questions pretty readily. And it mm -hmm. felt meaningful to them. It felt like when they were answering these questions about what they were feeling, it was telling them something about themselves that mm -hmm. was valuable. Mm -hmm. Right. So by putting it into words, it was already working to, to be valuable. Exactly. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And because you've got this heightened discernment now, you can look at that block that's pressuring in front of the chest and ask what's behind it. And you go, oh, now I understand why I suppress my expression. There's this fire behind it. I'm afraid of letting out, mm. right? And then you get to explore what's that fire about? Mm. What does it want, right? Mm. Mm. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic way of uh, exploring the self. Yes. And so over time, um, how many people would you say that you've now seen or talked to, and, you know, including friends, family, and actual clients or patients or whatever? What, how do you like to call the people who work with you, Joe? Um, clients, I guess. Okay. And so, clients and students, but probably, I don't know, many hundreds. Many hundreds. Yeah. Are there certain patterns that you see that actually fit each and every feeling or certain feelings like, you know, classes of feelings, depression almost always looks like this or anxiety almost always includes that or, or anything so, that would surprise us? Okay. Here's what would surprise you. Um, I mean, yes, there are certain structures that are common. For example, anxiety is often takes the shape of some sort of a container with mm. something in it that's not supposed to get out. Right, so a solid or some sort of impermeable container that has within it, it could be a rock even, and mm. inside of that rock is a luminous light, mm. and that light's not supposed to get out. Mm. You know? mm. So, and that could be experienced as, as a certain anxious anxiousness. Uh, wow. So, but, but the piece that's most important here, I think, in this work, when you create this map, when you ask these questions, you get this tangible representation of what it is that's in you that is this particular feeling expression. That map gives you a handle. That handle enables you to interact directly with the map itself, alter it in the way that I said, what if the gravity was going up and the feeling actually ah, yeah. changed. Yeah. So it's a little bit like you got an x-ray of a broken leg and you go, well, let me put that, you know, on the x-ray. On the x-ray, you move it. Pick the bones back together, paint it over, and the person walks out your office. Isn't that fascinating? Wow. Right? Yeah. So it's incredible. So what, what, the, the, what I learned was you can deliberately move it in any direction, but of course you want to move it in the direction that feels good. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. So you take this feeling, this block that's, you know, on your chest, for example, and you invite it to, okay, if it wanted to be harder or softer, what would feel better? Huh, softer. Okay. If it wants to be cooler or warmer, warmer. Okay. You know, and it turns into uh, sort of a luminous uh, gas that fills mm -hmm. your whole body, for example. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and, it, and, and so in that place, you have to ask, okay, well, what just happened? We took this self uh suppression and it turned into this expression right let's yes. say mm -hmm. what are we working with here the mm. ideas that we have about what a feeling is are blown to smithereens yes right right so what is this thing because you can put it back you can take it from here the block turn it into this luminous full body gas and you can put it back again yes but that fire that's behind it Let's say that fire wants to become like, uh, uh, let's just say it's a, like a vertical, almost like a spine um, made of this flexible but strong material that carries you forward. Let's just say that. Okay. okay. Yeah. So you've got this flame, you've got that turns into this spine, you've got this self suppression that turns into this expression. You can't take 
the self suppression and turn it into the spine. Right. You I can't. see that. I see. You can't and you can't take the flame and turn it into the expression. Yes. Right? So um what that suggests is that there are these feeling mode uh sort of entities. Yes. Uh, there's a there's a part of us, and that's how I refer to it when I work with people, that this part of you. These parts that are the thing that have an infinite range of expression, but a finite range of expression at the yes, same time. Yes. It's like mm -hmm. it has its domain of feeling expression that's different than the part next to it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I became really curious. What is a part? How many of these parts do we have? What is the, what, what's our makeup here? Yeah. It took me 15, almost 20 years to figure it out, but yeah. there is a structure to it that is wow. universal that we all share. Wow. There's a, there's a nine part structure nine, that, nine create, parts. that creates the experience of self. Wow. One third of those parts are about me. Uh, what's, what is me? One third of those parts are about what I am relating to outside of me. Mm -hmm. So there's the give and receive, there's the relationship. And the one third of the parts that are about the context that holds the relationship and supports it. Wow. So inside, outside context is built into us, one third of us in each of those domains. Wow. Which is just mind blowing. It is mind blowing. And so I imagine you have this now sort of categorized or mapped out or maybe even written or deliverable or your little, where are you in, along those lines as, as far as so, having this be something we can use? So um, it's, been, it's been really challenging for me to sort of write the book along the way because my understanding has continued to evolve. It's sort of plateauing now. I'm ready to write the book. Right now I have, my website is thefeelingmind.com. And on there, I'm starting to pour out as much as I can of what I've learned and make mm -hmm. it as available to people as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if someone wanted to get a hold of you, if someone wanted to learn a little bit more of you, yeah. the, thefeelingmind.com would be where to go. Is that That's correct? That's exactly right, yep. Okay, beautiful, yep. awesome. Wow. So, um, so what's your vision of, of where this goes five years from now, you know, 10 years from now for you, for this uh, construct, for this discovery, this nine part discovery for the, maybe teaching others or mentoring others? Well, how do you see this going, Joe? My vision is that the feeling mind becomes a thing that's recognized by everyone as supremely important. Yes that our culture suppresses feeling in favor of rational, logical, analytical thought. Right. And the consequences are appalling mm -hmm. to not just individuals, but to the planet as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so we need, I mean, absolutely need to take on this awareness of ourselves, to rewrite our understanding of human nature, to recognize that there are no bad people, for example. Exactly. Everyone, no matter, no matter how ugly or evil or dark the state is that, that, that I map in someone or myself, it always wants to be a, an expression of fullness and wholeness. Yes, exactly. So, well, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, please. yeah. That that's that's the ultimate vision. So, how long right. that takes, it might be beyond my lifetime. But that's fine, that's, right? That's I mean, what I'm working towards. Yeah, you yeah. point the ship in the direction, and you get what you get during yeah. this lifetime, and exactly. that's beautiful. Um, and that's aligned a lot with with what I'm up to, so which is basically how how we uh, began our, our our robust discussion back when we started just a few weeks ago. Yes. 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 Exactly. Super terrific. Well, thank you very much. Is there anything else you want to add before we close this session? I want to have you back. I want to have you back and we'll, we'll do some more interviews. But um, right. is there anything right. today that you want to either say to me or to other folks who might be watching this down the road? Um, thank you for what you're doing. I mm -hmm. mean, it took guts to step out uh, of the norms of your profession and say, you know what, this is not okay. Mm -hmm. And I, I just have immense respect for you, to you for, for doing that. Thank you. I yeah. got that. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. That's it. I feel complete. <laughs> All right. I feel complete too. What a great interview. Um, I'll talk to you soon. And uh, this will be, you know, this will, we'll put this up on, on Facebook and maybe other spaces as well. But let's, uh, 
uh, let's say goodbye for now. It's Friday. It's, um, we're, I, I don't know what it's like in Seattle, but it's one gorgeous day down here in Los Angeles. And yeah. um, uh, an opportunity to really uh, walk into the weekend tall, like maybe we're actually up to something in this crazy world. So awesome. thank you for being here together. Yeah, thank All you, right. Fred. All, All right. right, take care, Joe. Good to see All you. Right. Bye, Bye for now. Slowly, I have moved away from conventional medicine and really brought people to their own true self, bringing their own true voice. I had now become a healer when before I had been a doctor. So I ask you, where are you still being a doctor instead of the healer that you know you are? Where are you doing what you should rather than what you know is right, what you know is consistent with yourself? You need to have conversations with others in order to make a difference. And blurting or spilling your guts or screaming from the top of the mountain, that which has been rumbling in your belly the whole time, is not the same as true voice. True voice takes into consideration this idea of moving the conversation forward, of, of actually making an impact in a direction that you're intending. It takes creativity. It takes intention. It tastes self-respect and respect for another. There is an applause waiting for you as you take these steps forward. If it's not out loud, it'll certainly be in the hearts and souls of the people that you're with. Well, today what we have here is an opportunity to, um, to actually have a conversation with somebody I met by being a podcast guest for her. And then she came on and became part of this TVP process, the TVP uh, Maiden Voyage process, TVP One, the True Voice Podcasting. And Krista Sims has been a, a major superstar inside of, that, um, inside of that process of helping us take a number of people, the people you're meeting today, from zero to... I don't know, zero to podcasting. And so these are people who have found their true voice, uh, at least got more access to their true voice in the last few weeks, and then are delivering it effectively into the world. And Chris has been at the forefront of that for the course and even before she met me. And uh, Chris, it's just a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for being with us, for being um, just a mentor and then being a, a superstar with respect to that being able to spotlight your own goods, your own self uh, for the summit. It's just wonderful to know you and to have you here with us. Oh, thank you so much, Fred. And you know how we first got introduced? Mark Victor Hansen gave me your name and email. And I was like, oh, he sounds interesting. I went to your website and your perspective on mental health just blew me away. Hmm. And then when we had the interview, I was like, oh my gosh, hmm. you are just incredible. And your philosophy towards helping others is just groundbreaking. And then you said you were doing this podcasting mm -hmm. mastermind. And I was like, well, I already have a podcast, but there's something in my heart that said, go with him. Mm. Just do it. Mm -hmm. And so I just followed that. I didn't really follow like where I was at or what help I needed, but I actually did need the help that mm -hmm. your mastermind provided the TVP. Awesome. That is really great. And I'm really glad you came along and here we are at the summit already. And it's a, you know, it's possible that uh, as I'm speaking to Carissa, she's actually physically not only outside of the country, but in flipping Egypt. And so- <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite the adventurer. <laughs> so that's what we're dealing with here. It's possible that you're catching a recording of her. So I'm going to ask her, ask Carissa, I'm going to ask you a few questions about like, you know, what, a, what has been the experience through the true voice podcasting uh, mastermind through the last several months? And where are you, you know, where are you, what are you left with? And then where are you going? And you can answer that in any order that you choose. Yeah. So I would say in the beginning of the true voice podcasting mastermind, 
I felt like um, I had it all going on. I was organized and everything, but the mastermind felt like chaos to me and like, oh my gosh, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why I'm here. And then as the program evolved, I really made some deep connections with some of the participants. And I found that I could guide them and also learn from them. And specifically, Jackie Simmons was amazing. And she had me on her show, on her suicide prevention show. And I actually revealed my own attempt mm. to commit suicide when I was a child. And I had never shared that. Mm. And so it was like, this journey that I really never expected to be on. And then when you started bringing on these experts, I was truly blown away. Mm -hmm. I mean, you really brought the cream of the crop for experts and what we could learn from them and what they've done in the past and how they've made money and how we can do it too. So I feel like, and, and now we're kind of going into the editing and being an expert on that. And I really felt like it evolved into a master class for podcasting. Mm, it felt like, oh, maybe I don't need to be here. This is easy. I've been here to like, yes, there is so much more for you to learn. And I was truly blown away by the content of the mastermind. Awesome. Well, that's fabulous. Thank you for that. Thank you for recognizing even the chaos in the beginning. You know, the, the chaos in the beginning was, uh, uh, you know, sometimes you got to shake it up in order to get to the other side of wherever you're going. And, uh, you know, chaos is a, a natural occurrence of breaking new ground. Uh, because it's by definition, not anything like where we've been. And it looks a like beautiful it, reframe. <laughs> yeah, it, re it really is. Uh, you know, it really is. And the chaos itself was, um, you know, something that we all sort of walked through and then got to a space where uh, many, many of us, you know, myself included, got grounded in a whole new idea of the power of podcasting and the, and the capacity to deliver uh, effectively into a world that is really waiting to hear what we have to say. So where are you going with this now? What is up with your podcast? What kind of shifts have taken place? You can tell our audience a little bit about your podcast and what is the future of your podcast at this point? Yeah, I love that question because it has been such a journey for me. So about, uh, I would say, okay, so in 2019, I started my podcast. And it's called You Inspired. Yeah. And I interview inspiring people that have great stories. And, and I also do a meditation or healing at the end of each podcast episode. And when I first started, um, well, I'll have to tell you a story also about how I got started because it's kind of amazing. I had this thought that I wanted to do a podcast. And um, my husband was working with a podcast mic company, Rode, Rode Mics, <laughs> and he came home with a podcast mic mm. for me. Mm. <laughs> He's like, do you want this? I was like, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> so then I was like, I guess I need to start a podcast because it had been in my mind for yeah. a few months at that point. When I started, I would say I had no idea what I was doing. And he, my husband's an audio engineer, so he knows about editing. So he helped me edit, but I didn't really know how to post, where to post, all of that. So I was floundering for about six months and I only had a few episodes here and there, very inconsistent. And then something shifted in me where I finally got into a flow of editing. I didn't realize I could hire people at this point, <laughs> you know, to edit all of it and do all this for me. So I kind of learned just boots on the ground, getting down into it. And then, and then I started realizing that I could interview some really powerful people. And so I had intention to eventually interview people like Mark Canfield, Mark Victor Hansen, and really people that are making a difference in the world that are famous that could uh, elevate my podcast to a whole new level. So I had that attention intention. And originally I was just interviewing my friends, anyone, I was desperate for interviews, to sure. be honest. 
And, and then I got connected with this um, publicity expo and I just said, I'm going to be media. So I, I said, I'm media for this show. And I got just amazing best-selling authors and guests, like an unlimited pool of resources. Super great. And then I interviewed this person, Tim Schur. I know Tim. You know, Tim. Okay, I great. I was on a show. And, I've been on a show a couple of oh, times. Oh, his, he's amazing. Yeah. Magician. And he's like, I really like your interview style. I'm going to connect you with people I know. And that's when I started interviewing famous people like Mark Victor Hansen and you. And, and uh, it was really amazing how just one person can shift your whole destiny and what you're doing. And yeah. then I have to say, I'm, I'm still like excited. I, I love you inspired. And during the TVP mastermind, I had an idea in integrating business and spirituality because I'm a spiritual mm. healer. I teach meditation and mm -hmm. I work with corporations, mm -hmm. but, um, I thought of this idea, Zen success, Love move it. Thank you. Move from force to flow. So that is going to be my new podcast that I'm going to be launching. And I, I'm so excited. That's so great. And so thanks for sharing that with us. And we can't wait to be there with you. And, um, you know, if you have something to say about people who are thinking about starting a podcast or people who are thinking about like they, you know, they haven't been there yet, but they really, they like listening or they maybe even a little clueless about what podcast, the power of podcast. What would you say to somebody who's like ready, willing, and able to start a podcast, but doesn't have a clue how, how to take those first steps? Well, I would say, first of all, if you're serious about this, find a mentor, find someone who's done it before or sign up for Fred's class, TVP mastermind that has everything that you need all in one space. So, um, I would say the first step in setting everything up is the most challenging. So if you can get some guidance on that, um, and then recording and editing and posting, and maybe you can outsource that. Then all you need to do is um, book your guests and, and they even have producers that are willing to sure. do that. If you have the budget, then you can hire someone to book guests for you. Right. I have a friend that has their own podcast and they book guests for the, the podcast. So Absolutely. It's, it's really great. Yeah, you can go from anywhere from zero to 100. You can do it all yourself or you can do the little piecemeal stuff with other people who are distributors or who are post producers or, um, you know, editors or musicians who can uh, who can boy, uh, boy up your podcast. And it's not so hard to get started. So I'm so glad you're part of the True Voice community. I hope you uh, continue to be as big a part as you've been. It's great to watch you grow and to be on the same uh, you know, be on the same wall as you, as you grow, as we both grow as podcasters and mentors and teachers and learners in this really wonderful process of catching up with this platform. Thank you for being part of TVP. Thank you for being part of the summit. Thank you for, uh, you know, making it your business to pre-record, uh, before you leave the country. And I've just loved working with you. So thank you so much, Carissa. And I would just say, go do it. Be a Yay. podcaster. That's Live awesome. your best life. Thank you.